All right, so let's start because I think we have a lot on our plates. Um, first, I just want to, uh, uh, we have three members of our delegation in the room and I believe uh, Ann Watson, Senator Ann Watson is on uh, Zoom. So thank you for coming. Uh, we have uh, Senator Furchlick, Senator Cummings and Representative Casey. Uh, so really appreciate you being part of this discussion. We were originally planning to have this be kind of a, you know, more of a talk about what's going on in the legislature, but the legislature is moving. So we're talking about what the legislature has put on our, our plates tonight and uh, definitely welcome your, your participation as, as we, we move forward. And thanks again uh, for being here. Um, we're gonna get into this later, but, uh, but as people who've been following the legislature know, uh, the budget that we passed, um, the law that we were uh, grappling with when we passed the original budget, uh, it looks like it is going to be changed in a way that we are going to have to talk substantially about this evening. That is going to be the main focus of this <coughs> evening. Uh, we are going to add a second public comment uh, after that discussion, so we can get you know further input from uh, the public after they've they've kind of heard um, how, how we're processing it. Uh, and the other thing I want to acknowledge is this is uh, Emma Bay Hansen's last night as a board member. Going out with a bang, Emma. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's going to be a fun one. <laughs> Uh, but I really appreciate all the, the fantastic work you've done on the board, uh, your leadership, your, your, your work on the policy committee, uh, and really kind of your unwavering voice for doing what's best for students and best for community members. So really appreciate uh, your service and, and we're, we're going to, to miss you going forward. After tonight, you may not miss us, but uh, <laughs> we certainly will miss, miss you. So thank you. And we welcome you back done. anytime. Yes. Thanks. Um, so with that, the first order of business is, is public comment. And again, I do uh, want to state we're going to have a, a second public comment. Um, uh, public comment, particularly at a night like tonight, uh, is, is very important for our decision-making process. Uh, you know, obviously, the budget is going to be front and center tonight, but um, you know, particularly for this first public comment, uh, you know, we welcome any, any, any feedback you have. Uh, we do not respond live in public comment, although I'm guessing the second part, we may open it up for some discussion because this is going to be a continuing discussion, but just because we do not answer you in real time, uh, does not mean that we're not hearing you. Um, uh, we take all this feedback, you know, very seriously, uh, as part of our decision-making process and, and again, appreciate the 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 courage it sometimes takes to get up and, and speak in front of a, a deliberative body um i just want to say because we have a slightly different zoom uh, protocol um so for attendees who wish to make a public comment please introduce yourself to the public record uh use the raise hand feature to indicate if you would like to speak uh, it's if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a reactions button. Um, the reactions button uh, is where you can find uh, the uh, the raise hand function. Uh, you will be called on, uh, and then you'll be prompted to unmute yourself. Uh, and please note that attendees only have uh, the audio feature, no video. If you are speaking and would like to be on video, please say so at the start of your comments. Uh, and the host will temporarily convert you to a panelist. Uh, you'll be able to share your video as a panelist. And once your public comment is over, uh, you will be converted back to an attendee. And we've put this in place because we got um, kind of uh, Zoom bombed uh, a few weeks ago uh, in a way that was not really productive. Uh, so if anyone in the room would like to, to public comment uh, now, before we have the discussion again, there will be a, a second opportunity afterwards. Uh, please feel free to, to come to the uh, the front of the room. Um, you know what? Great. Thank you. And online, if <clears throat> anyone, uh, either raise, raise hand function, um, 
I think because we can't see you anymore, we don't have the Anna's in control. Anna can see them. Oh, Anna can see them. Yeah. yeah so if, if you if you don't have okay, it looks like we have one. Uh, uh, John, go ahead. And even though I know who you are, please introduce yourself as well for the record. Absolutely. Uh, can you hear me well? Very well. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I will be brief and to the point. Um, my name is John Guifrey. I was the chair of the Roxbury School Board before the merger and chaired the merger committee. I helped architect and orchestrate one of the more successful mergers in the state during Act 46's impact period. Uh, I am now the select board chair in Roxbury. And uh, with the lackluster results of Act 46, the legislature has now come up with yet another twist to try to tweak the original Act 60 and its impact. Uh, despite my vigorous objections to its aims and assertions, it still went through and here we are again six years later. Uh, I spoke at the Ed Committee hearings during Act, uh, 153, 883, the lead into 46. I consistently urged the legislature to stop tinkering with a broken system. My comments and urging were not listened to. And not surprisingly, none of the efforts of the legislature have actually solved the problems. 153 didn't, 46 didn't, and 127 won't either. It's no surprise that the most recent hair on fire moment by our legislature was in response to once again poorly crafted legislation. And this most recent adjustment is in response to a local response, which one could see from a mile away. But our legislators, legislators didn't. Once again, proving with continued and consistent evidence, our legislator is, legislature is not up to the task of solving this problem in the state. I don't have the time, nor is this the venue, to provide the prescription, but 127 definitely is not that. It, that, that fact is already, that it's already a disaster before it's even implemented is irrefutable proof that of that and their tone deaf lack of understanding of trying to change things at a date in the budget cycle when budgets have already been approved and things have gone to the printer for town meeting only further shows evidence of this incompetence. So my criticism aside, what am I advocating for? Firstly, to the school board, I urge you in the strongest possible manner to do nothing with the budget you approved already. Do not capitulate to the pressure being placed on our school system uh, by poor legislation and legislators that do not have the backbone to admit failure and go back to the drawing board. If they are so entrenched and blind to continue to try to make a fatally flawed system work, then they will face the wrath of the taxpayers at election time. They have failed to serve. Send the budget through and see where it may fall. This will force them, our legislature, to address it. As I spoke at an earlier board meeting, you can't pull this volume of funding out of a budget and expect it to function. Do not bow to this pressure because if you do, you will make cuts and changes that can never be recovered from. This is an existential crisis for our district and many others facing these similar absurd requirements that our legislators imposed on us. When you make these type of cuts, they aren't slicing superfluous programs or pencil budgets. These are structural things that will create catastrophic and unrecoverable tailspin for our district. If you close a building, for instance, to try to meet some of these cuts, which only a portion of them, a small portion of them will be realized, that's a 75 to 100 year impact made in the heat of the moment under a cartoon like mandate imposed by poorly conceived legislation. Don't do it and don't give in. I urge you to take a stand and be the leaders our community and our state needs right now because we aren't getting that from our governor or our legislature. If you want change, you need to be that change and capitulation will only reinforce this 20 year pattern of ill-conceived attempts at solving a problem that is much deeper than funding formulas. Secondly, to our legislators in attendance tonight, I haven't had the time to look into where you stand individually on 127, but it is my expectation as your constituent that you are not only opposed to this legislation and its impacts, but that you will actively stand up against it and get it put on hold or modified for reduced impact until such a time a better idea is in place. 127 is not going to solve it and it will irreparably harm not only our school systems, but our communities. If you don't stop this, you will be responsible for decades of decline in our communities by eviscerating our school district. Your legacy will be the destruction of the very system you are trying to save. I urge everyone listening to hold these legislatures 
to these standards and expectations. Again, if we want change, we have to be the ones that institute that change. These legislatures were part of the legislators were part of the group that made the rules, and they are the ones who can change them. If they don't, they should be voted out at the next opportunity. Thirdly, I implore all of those listening not to bow to this absurd legislation and encourage the board to stick with their budget. Support your school board in this fight and support your teachers and school systems. They are the beating heart of any successful community all around our state and country. Successful communities are inexorably linked to the successful school system. It is worth your money. Fight back with your dollars and forget giving them to some national election race this year and put them towards your tax dollars. This is a fight right in front of your face in your backyard. We all may need to take a hit on this this year financially to make the point. This legislation can't last. And if we hold out long enough, something will change. If we want long term solutions that work for that work for families, districts and communities, we need better from our legislature and leadership. We need real solutions and not some half-baked funding formula tweak that, as mentioned previously, has already proven its lack of foresight as they scramble to adjust it now before it ever was even implemented. The fight only ends when the one being harmed gives up. We are the harmed. Your community's long-term well-being is at stake. Do not lose sight of the big picture in an effort to solve the fly annoying you on the tip of your nose at the moment. We have to be bigger than this, and we have to find better solutions. That is a future conversation, but the time for immediate action on this is now. Thank you, and I appreciate your time. Thanks, John. Uh, so we have three more people in the queue. I just might have a lag because Anna has to switch. Yeah, yep. okay. Um, Phil Dodd. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Great. Uh, I've been uh, reading about this or, and writing about this topic uh, recently, but I'm here, here tonight. I'm not covering this meeting. Um, I just want to offer some personal perspective. Um, you know, for the school board, I just I just want to say that the, the new transition plan being discussed in the legislature would give Montpelier-Roxbury an 11 cent reduction in its tax rate for FY 2025. A nice gesture, but one that is less generous than the 5% equalized tax rate cap the legislature is now getting rid of. I don't know yet what that will mean for the district in terms of a tax rate change, but I fear it will be no better than the 19.2% increase we are looking at now and could well be worse for the district. Given the additional fact that we don't know if the new plan might change in some way before it is signed into law, I would urge the school board to cancel the March 5th budget vote Consider further cuts to the budget and wait for more information. Voters should have the best understanding of the budget and taxes possible before they vote, and the situation now is confused, to say the least. The new transition plan would create a closer connection between budget cuts and tax rates. Any budget cuts you make from here on will reduce the tax rate, unlike the situation with a 5% cap. Delaying the vote will give you more time to look more closely at the budget. The severe tax pressures facing Montpelier-Roxbury probably means you should seriously consider closing the Roxbury School in FY 2026 and shifting students to Union School where enrollment is projected to decline. The new situation also means the district should reopen discussion with U32 about a possible merger. Um, just an additional uh, message for our legislators, thank you very much for attending. Uh, my belief is Act 127 has placed an unfair burden on districts like Montpelier-Roxbury. When major changes to the education finance system were made in the past, more revenue sources were added to the Ed Fund. This time, the changes are taking place at a time when the surpluses of recent years are gone and no new revenues are being added. Rather than helping our out districts that need more aid and also maintaining quality education where it already exists, Act 127 is a zero-sum game in which our better school districts are being made to suffer big budget cuts or huge tax increases. Montpelier is now seen as a gold town. In light of that, at least the proposed transition plan should provide more aid to districts who are seeing their tax capacity shrink due to the new weights, like Montpelier-Roxbury. The proposed plan reduces tax rates in advantaged districts by one cent for every 1% drop in tax capacity giving us the 11 cent tax reduction for next year. 
I suggest pushing for a more generous transition of a two cent tax rate reduction for every 1% drop in tax capacity, which would translate to a 22 cent tax reduction for Montpelier Roxbury in FY 2025. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Great, thank you, Phil. Uh, looks like we have Jim Eikenberry next. And even though I just introduced you, please introduce yourself as well. Hey, folks, this is Jim. Did it work on mute? Yes. Yep. Yep, we can hear, we can hear you. you. Great. Uh, sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Um, thanks to our legislators for being there. Um, I want to say first to the board, uh, thank you so much for all your hard work. I feel like it's been <laughs> four or five or even more months that um, I've been attending some of your meetings, uh, working on this budget. I feel like we really worked hard and listened to people and found a budget that would work for our school without adding superfluous things. So I, I think we need to stick with the budget. I think it's good for our school. And um, I really don't like the idea of suddenly trying to patch it away at it, because at that point, uh, it's going to be really just um, detrimental to our students and to our community. Um, to the legislators in attendance, um, as you know from the other speakers and everything else you're experiencing, um, without 127 going into place yet, it's already causing some chaos. It was super well intended, and we all want to have equity throughout the state and to make sure that each student is getting what they need, regardless of where they are in Vermont. Um, Clearly, the situation is dire right now. I think it's irresponsible to suddenly change it and remove the five, you know, percent cap and throw something else in there. Um, I just think that that's uh, beyond irresponsible when you think about the, the time and resources that all these folks have put in in all these districts to work on these budgets for months now. Um, I think you either need to put a pause on Act 127 and have it, you know, not start this year, but give it another year to, to give yourself time to really think through what needs to happen and go back to the old per pupil formula um, or just deal with it 127 as it is, stick with the 5% cap, trust that everybody did the best they could with that and then take the lumps to the education fund um, and do it as it may, changing midstream I really think is um, going to have a negative impact on the students and on our communities. So just urge you to consider that. And again, to the board, thank you for all your hard work. I think the budget we have in place is a good one. And I really don't want to see changes made to it. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, one more speaker who, um, uh, please go ahead. I can see your first name, but not your last. Hi, everyone. This is Joe. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, Joe. Yes. Hi. Uh, I think y'all know me, president of the MREA, our local teachers union, zooming in from Independence Green. Um, I, I had two things to speak on tonight. Uh, the first actually isn't ar around the budget. It's around a bill in the state Senate, S-284, and it essentially proposes a cell phone ban in schools. And I think the bill thoughtfully places technology use in the context of students' mental health and, you know, students' right to an education without data collection and monetized distraction of many social media platforms. But I don't really want to talk about the merits right now. I think that's between schools, caregivers, teachers, students, et cetera. I, I want only to advocate that wherever that bill or a sort of MRPS version of it lands, we don't put the burden of it on individual teachers to enforce it. I think it would be a much more helpful and systematic uh, way to view this as a community or a district-wide project where administrators, students, parents, caregivers, we all agree on norms together and then we enforce them at the door, not in individual classrooms. In other words, what I'm saying is if we move in that direction, either by legal requirement or by community discussion and consensus, I'd like to advocate that we take care of it when students enter the building and not require teachers sort of every day in every class to have to spend learning and community time reminding students and sort of debating the merits of cell phone use. It can kind of really tax our ability to teach the kids. And then secondly, as for the unfortunate certainty surrounding budgets across the state and in our district, 
I want to thank the board for being so careful throughout the process. I've been there for a few meetings in a row, and I just I'm really impressed by the thoughtfulness that y'all bring to this process. But I would also advocate for the board to keep the budget as is and send it forward to the community on town meeting day rather than restart the process and potentially open up painful conversations about educators futures in our district. And I say that as somebody who lives in and loves this community, and I just hope that my fellow voters will ultimately decide to fund the schools despite the increased tax burden. And I also hope that in the coming years, the legislature will develop a better and more progressive way to fund the schools in Vermont. Uh, so thank you for listening and have a good meeting. Appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> um, you know do you mind just giving like another prompt to the audience that's in the room if they have public comment now? Yes, and yeah, there's also the yeah reminder that we're gonna have it. Yeah, second one later. Uh, but if anyone else wants to speak in the room, um, please do so. All right, thank you. Um, so this is the consent agenda, and then we can get to of our agenda. Um, do you have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move we approve the consent agenda. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay? Or <laughs> say nay. That's what we opposed. could say if exactly. we're opposing it. <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not opposed, just for the record. <laughs> uh, so consent agenda passes. Um, can I can I put Emma's hat on for just one second to ask you to remind folks for anybody who's brand new to a meeting, oh. what is the consent agenda? What did we just do? We just approved a bunch of stuff that is kind of non-controversial, like minutes of meetings and um, draft agendas, the superintendent's reports. Uh, you yeah, know, we had some. Uh, personnel stuff that was just pro forma. So that's what we approved. So thank you. Thank you, Mia, for the reminder. Um, How do we want to do this? Do we want to do the presentation first so then the legislators can be part of the discussion? Uh, or that's nodding. You see Andy nodding. I'm waiting to see what Anne yeah. Ann seems to think about that. I'm I'm sorry, I'm Senator Cummings. I should be much more professional. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, sound good for the board? Yes. And for sure. you all? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, let's pull up the presentation for today. And I think I've said this now a few times. Um, this is hard stuff that we're going to be talking about today. And <clears throat> we are going to try to show it as non-judgmentally as we can. And Christina, I'll call you up too if you want to take the hot seat here or come up closer just in case we have questions for you as we go. Okay, so as most people in the room and online are aware of, <clears throat> there has been potential changes to Act 127. It is not written in law as of yet, um, but my understanding is that it will be. Um, and it definitely influences the budget that was approved in January on the 17th. So just as a little refresher, Act 127, and there's a link to the original act there, uh, begins in FY25, which is the budget that was just approved by the board for next school year. Um, it's related to improving student equity by adjusting the school funding formula. Vermont has a rather complicated school funding formula for education finance. And this influences one piece of it, which in turn uh, secondarily influences other pieces of it. So it influences the way students are weighted. As most of us know by now who have been following the budget process, um, our student count for educational finance is not kids in seats, individual kids in seats, but each child is weighted in a different way. Um, concern, and the weights are based on uh, student needs for education. So secondary students, have more teachers involved in their world, and so therefore they are weighted heavier than an elementary school student. Um, students who come to our school district who are in need of learning English have significant needs that a student who already knows English does not, so they are weighted heavily. 
students from poverty are weighted more heavily. So different weights are attached to students' identities based on based on what they come to us with, with the idea that more those weights come with more dollars to help educate those students. This is a good thing. This, this, is, an, this is a good thing in our education law. Um, the original law, so the original 127, when I say that, um, included a tax rate review at 10% per weighted pupil increase. The board grappled with that for a while. We came in below the 10% per pupil. We are still there. That is not on the table for discussion tonight. Um, and it's still a part of the law. And, and there was a 5% cap on the equalized tax rate, which is our tax rate prior to the common level of appraisal being factored in. Um, and the, the tax rate for the CLA is what ultimately comes on our tax bills. Um, the CLA is not something the school district or school board has any control over. That's a factor that we receive from the tax department. This was the legislation as written here in a really short summary <laughs> that the MRPS board and administration had when creating and approving the budget for FY25. So this was what our understanding that we were working under for um, that budget process and our, our former discussions. There is trouble with that 5% cap and this is how we got there in a broad summary. <laughs> so first, when the modeling was done for Act 127, which were which was several years ago now, um, the statewide salary and benefits that they used to do those models were much lower than they are now. So there were several negotiation rounds, well, I'd, I'd say at least one major negotiation round with unions. Um, and in that negotiation round, statewide salaries increased, increased considerably. It was after COVID. There's a lot of bargaining power. There's a teacher shortage across the state. So those salaries were much greater. The increase was much greater statewide, um, including MRPS, than they had been previously and what was being used to model. In addition to that, healthcare benefits, which is not something the school board or administration have any control over, it's a statewide negotiation, those continue to increase every year. So the savings that were hoped to be realized when that law was passed several years ago now, yeah, um, have not been realized. So this year's increase in healthcare bene benefits was a 16.4% increase, which was considerable. That was not part of the model when our joint fiscal office colleagues were doing that for Act 27 before it was passed. So that's one piece. The second piece is that we had federal funding in terms of ESSER, um, and school districts across the state use those for different reasons. Some were for positions for needed services for students as our students had some challenges through COVID, as we all know. Um, some of that money was used for one-time funds. The needs of our students across the state, including at MRPS, have not gone away <laughs> just because the ESSER funds have gone away. Um, so those aren't extra positions, those are needed positions. And I can speak personally for MRPS, we've designed systems um, with, and we're able to do those systems faster because of the ESSER funding. Um, however, what MRPS, I will say, has done for this little piece is for every position from, that was funded through ESSER funds that we've brought into local funds, we had an equal reduction. And we didn't just do that this year, we did that in past years as well. Number three, so several districts um, added in costs that for this budget cycle, for developing their FY25 budget, um, that they believe, because they believe their taxpayers were protected by this 5% cap. And I say that with no judgment whatsoever. Under the first law, under the first way 127 was crafted originally, they were protected by a 5% cap. Um, we did not add in additional costs in our original budget. Um, in the way that, that other districts did. However, there was considerable costs added to district budgets because that was the way the law was written. And, and they, were, they, were told not, they were never told not to do that. So, so that was something that they did. Number four, and for, forgive my rather unprofessional language, I really couldn't figure out a way to say this, it tanked the dollar yield. So all of this money that was being stressed upon the education fund or predicted, anticipated, to, to be pulled out of the education fund without a revenue source in tax, taxes because of that cap completely tanked the dollar yield. 
And it's my understanding the dollar yield was around 7,000 last week. Last year, it was at above 15,000 to give you a sense. The budget we developed was based on a $9,171 dollar yield. So in, from the time we passed our budget or approved our budget, the dollar yield had sank $2,000 more. When that dollar yield sinks, <clears throat> taxes increase. The only districts who could increase their taxes were those not capped. And so because of that, because of that tanking of the dollar yield, every district, even the most advantaged districts under 127 were pushed into the cap, thereby eliminating any sort of revenue source into the education fund, which can't happen, right? So we don't have a leveling source for the education fund now if every district is capped, that's a problem. Um, so that's how we got here and why the legislature um, needs to act around the 5% cap. It's unfortunate timing, and it also is necessary at the same time because of these factors here. So the legislature's reaction, um, potential reaction, I should say always potential reaction <laughs> because it's not written in law yet, is to eliminate the cap and have a different transition mechanism. So the 5% cap was meant as a transition mechanism for districts like ours who lost weighted pupils. Um, so that, it, uh, you know, we've heard the land softly over the next five years. Um, for more information on this, uh, Christina and I sat um, through the Ways and Means Committee yesterday, uh, and Julia Richter of the Joint Fiscal Office had an excellent slideshow to explain both 127 um, and why we needed a different transition model. The link to the YouTube video is there. Uh, and also Julia's slideshow is there. So just if anybody wants more information and wants to nerd out on this a little bit more, you are welcome to click on those links. You can also find it on the House Ways and Means Committee YouTube, YouTube channel. <clears throat> so there's a revision in the House right now. It's still in the House, correct? Hasn't gone anywhere else? Is that? Okay, introduced in the House today. Uh, for a revision to the transition mechanism in Act 127, only the transition mechanism, so only that 5% cap. And the, the suggestion is to change it to a cent reduction for districts who were disadvantaged by 127. So people who followed Act 46 with the merger and districts who merged willingly got a I don't know what it was, a six cent reduction one year, a four cent reduction the next year, a two cent, eight, four, six, four, two. So it's a similar mechanism as that. However, it's not a universal piece like that. So the amount of the reduction, and this is directly from Julia's slideshow, so I, I apologize for the jargon, is based on the district share of the statewide pupil count. So there's a pupil count for the whole district, which went up because we're counting more pupils under the new weights. And our share of that is what matters. Right? So the percentage is decided by the relative change in the district share of statewide pupils from FY24 to FY25. So when MRPS is looking at that, our share in FY24 was larger in the statewide pupil count than it is with the new weighting system. That's smaller, which is why we're considered a disadvantaged district under this law. Disadvantage is keeping in mind means that we either have to significantly raise our tax taxes in order to keep the same programming, or we have to eliminate programming in order to, um, or eliminate things in our budget in order to bring down our taxes. So our tax capacity has gotten smaller. So the percentage that, that is determined, was determined by the Agency of Education based on our long-term weighted <clears throat> average daily membership, which is the, kind of the same thing as equalized people, would equal the cent decrease for year one. It is, your, it is a five-year thing that I'll get to later. And only disadvantaged districts would receive this transition mechanism. That was another piece of the original Act 127 with the 5% cap. Any district could access it. So including districts who are advantaged by Act 127 could access that 5% cap. This eliminates that. So there's approximately 30 to 40 districts who now qualify for this. MRPS is number 14 on that list. So we're right smack dab in the middle. Just for, just for the, the board and community's knowledge, 
only three districts in central Vermont will qualify for this um, discount, essentially. Um, Stowe, MRPS, and Harwood. And those are the relative percentages. So under this proposal from the House, MRPS would essentially in FY25 get an 11 cent discount on our taxes, which is what one of the, which was what uh, Phil Dodd was referencing in his public comment, the 11 cents. Do you have a question right there? Do you know where that, those figures in the right-hand column came from? <laughs> yeah, there are share of the, there the change in our share of the people count. The middle column. Yeah. What, but the right hand column. They just made, here's your percentage. Yeah. Here's, here's your sense. So that, that yeah. that's my understanding of it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> it's not exact. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what does this mean for MRPS and FY25? Instead of the 5% cap on the equalized rate, MRPS should possibly, if the law goes through, receive an 11 cent decrease on our equalized tax rate. So up here, this chart is, a board, is something the board has seen quite a bit. So on the left-hand column is the mathematical equation. It's a little tough to see on the screen for the board, I understand that, but it's a mathematical equation of how education finance works. The gray column on the left is the, the budget that was approved January 7th. Teeth. The budget on the right is where we would stand with the with, when the cap has gone away and the 11 cent decrease comes in. The thing to note here is that there are two changes on the column on the right. One is the dollar yield. So it's anticipated with this new transition mechanism that the dollar yield will increase. The reason why that's anticipated is because the 5% cap was very helpful for a lot of districts. And it's, it's, it's anticipated that districts will open up, some districts will open up their budget to, to eliminate some of that funding. And so when there's not such a strain on the education fund, the dollar yield can come up again. Jake, would you add anything to that? I'm gonna try not to put you on the spot, but would you add anything to that? That was good, okay. All right, so. The dollar yield um, is now anticipated to be 9,775. I'll remind you that that's not set into law until May. May, May. There's so many experts in the room, it's a little intimidating, I have to say. <laughs> and and it's, it's fluid. It, yeah. The, the dollar yield has, has done a lot of things in the last few years. <laughs> yes, it has. So if it stays at that, it'll, it'll be pretty amazing. So our equal, under the new 11 cent discount, I'll call it, uh, our equalized tax rate is coming in at a dollar, and the new dollar yield is coming in at a dollar forty nine one minus eleven cents. So the adjusted equalized tax rate, which is the tax rate before the CLA is factored in, is a dollar thirty eight one. This is higher than it was for the five percent cap. For the five percent cap, it was a dollar thirty three seven. In Montpelier, with the, with the CLA staying at 100.18%, that makes the residential tax rate with CLA for Montpelier at $1.379, mm -hmm. and the residential tax rate with CLA for Roxbury at $1.461. So keep them going. What does this mean in, what does this new tax rate mean in dollars? So you can see this is, the board has seen a chart like this before. Um, this is what that means actually for a person, for a homestead who is not protected by the sensitive sensitivity, homestead sensitivity. What that translates to. I think it's important to note that two thirds of Vermont, of Montpelier residents receive and, income sensitivity. And roughly two thirds of Roxbury residents. And so yeah. this is only for one third of the taxpayers. But even those two thirds, they will see an increase. They're not sure. Proportionally. It's just, it's just they'll, be, see, they'll see a proportional increase. They'll see a yeah. proportional increase. Yes. And before the board asks, there's no way we can tell you what that looks like because it's individualized for people. Yeah. And, and I think it's also worth pointing out that a lot of those two thirds people are already on fixed income budgets, which is why they receive that. And um, right. even proportional increases are increases. Increases. Yeah. Okay. So what's projected to happen in the next five years? 
And I'm going to, I'm the board's not going to like this, but we're not going to be able to give you a whole lot of information on this. Um, this is what's projected based on the fact sheet that we got from the Agency of Education and the Ways and Means Committee. You can see it yourself online. Um, we're not positive how this was figured out other than it's just a decrease each year. We're like, we're just not positive how to explain this or why. Jake's like, I can. <laughs> so, um... It's 11 cents in the first year. 20% of that would be 2.2 cents. There's a missing decimal on, on that table. So the okay. next year would be 11 cents minus 2.2 cents would be 8.8 .8 cents. The year after that would be 6.6. .6. Oh, I think Nicole rounded them. Oh. In the, yeah. 4.4, 2.2, then zero. So it's a 20% reduction each year, five years, 20% down each year. In the original law, the cap was supposed to be in place for five years. And so Ways and Means were, were pretty adamant about keeping that five year, some sort of protection for the five years. But all those charts we did about predictions, throw those out the window board. Just throw them out the window. Don't think about them again. Glad I spent the time. All right. So what would more decreases to the FY25 budget look like? So what do we got here? The first row there, the 32,316, that's your approved budget. That is what is in the budget right now that has been approved. So there's no decrease. Um, <clears throat> talking about that, that, those are the two tax rates for the two towns that would equal a 23.07 increase for Montpelier and approximately a 12% increase for Roxbury, as is what, what the budget has been approved, which the board could decide to keep. If we have these numbers, um, Kristen pointed this out to me earlier, these, these decreased numbers are, are arbitrary. I was just, we were pulling out numbers to, in order to show how much money we're talking about to get a significant decrease in the, in the tax rate. So if we were to decrease 1.5 million, then that makes Montpelier's tax rate with the discount and an assumed dollar yield of 9,775 to be a dollar two nine five, and that's a fifteen point six three percent increase. And in Roxbury, it would be a dollar three seven three with a five point two two percent increase over last year. If we were to further cut that budget three three million dollars, then we could get it to an eight point two percent increase in Montpelier, and the Roxbury tax rate would decrease by one point five five percent if we were to make that many cuts. So we've got some urgent decisions to make as a school board tonight. And I want to stress these, this decision needs to be made tonight. With the understanding that this legislative action will most likely be reality, does the school board want to reopen the budget and decrease the total district budget in order to lower the tax impact or leave the budget as is? So what happens if you open the budget? just so you have all the information here. We talked to both town clerks today at length. John Odom was my best friend today. So number one, school budget will not be voted on as part of town meeting day. The ballots have already been printed, I believe in both towns. And so essentially we'll have a, a Sharpie party and, and just cross out the school board budget if, we, if you decide to open it up. That won't matter. Even if people vote on it, it won't matter if you've decided to open this up. The school board will need to approve a new budget by February 15th for a vote to occur on March 14th. Eight days away. Just Those are not typos. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The reason for that is because we have a contract. And in our contract, the RIF, the reduction in force deadline for a past budget on the first vote is March 15th. The town clerks need approximately four weeks before the schedule of vote to appropriately warn and print ballots for a first vote which is why we need to have decisions made to send to the town clerks by February 15th. A separate election for just school budgets would occur on March 14th. Should the budget fail to pass on the first vote, there would need to be an immediate turnaround for a revote. By law, the earliest the board could reissue a revote is seven days after the failed vote. And the, the reduction in force deadline for a failed budget is March 31st. <clears throat> So essentially, if if the vote if the if we decide to reopen the budget and we vote on March 14th and that goes down, we have seven days to to get a new budget out there, 
And um, because we have to meet the second RIF deadline by March 31st. If we don't do that, then there's some dire things that we have to do that I'd rather not talk about. <laughs> we might have to talk about that. <laughs> Just to know what they are. But I have a clarifying question on yeah. this slide, which yeah. is if town clerks need four weeks before the scheduled vote to appropriately warn, let's say these things happen. We have a vote on the 14th, the budget goes down. That actually doesn't give us the four weeks. There's not yeah. the four weeks in there. So the re-vote is different. Okay. It's the initial vote. I see. Okay. And okay. that's all done by statute and that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Rep. Um, the RIF deadline that you're referring to there, that's per the MREA contract. Yes. That's not part of any. That's not part of the legislation. Not, that's just, that's kind of just the constraint we have at MRPS <clears throat> based on our contractual language. And that's the last line for a failed budget, right? <clears throat> I'm sorry, say it again. Is it the last line that he's referring to, or is that the? Yeah. Both the 15th and the 31st. Yeah. The 15th is for a first vote. In our contract, there's no language of a first vote on town meeting day. It's just first vote. So, that's, so that vote has to occur prior to the March 15th date, because if the board needs to do more reductions in force, you need to be able to do it by the contracted deadlines. So I think you answered my question, but I'm just going to double check. So the RIF deadline for a failed budget, regardless of when that failed budget vote happened, is the 31st, correct? So having our vote on town meeting day gives us the most amount of time between the vote and the RIF deadline? If you have the, if you have the vote on town meeting day, so that means you're keeping the budget as is, right. you're not changing it, and that vote passes, that's great. If it fails, then you have until March 31st. For really. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, really. So my league team, my administration team, when we were going through this today, had a lot of funny gifts to put in this around like questions. <laughs> like of course there's <laughs> tons of them probably, nah. um, but we did not, we declined to send them in. <laughs> Yeah, and before I open it up to board discussion, um, would love to give the <laughs> legislators a, a chance to talk. I also just want to make a couple couple comments about Act 127. I mean, I, th I think we can't forget that we endorsed the concept, and I think we support the concept, and I think we do not have issues with the weights. Uh, I think everyone agrees that the the five percent cap was was poorly designed. Um, I'm personally going to kind of applaud the legislator for attempting to fix it. I think the damage to the ed fund of the cap um, was significant and long lasting. And, and while this puts us in a bind, uh, I think there's a very good argument that it does a lot to stabilize the ed fund long term. And I think that's good for education, uh, even if it puts us in a, a bind tonight. Um, so I, I thank you for for your hard work on that, even though the, the first the first attempt had some some notable flaws. Um, but if you have anything you want to add about um, you know what we can expect, I know that you know it has not passed and been signed into law yet. Um, so just any any observations on, on your part before we we delve in would be helpful. But did, no need to if you if you don't feel. And you want to come up to the seat and remove up just because of the microphone. Oh, okay. Well, you did a better job than I could explaining what's going on. Um, I went to my first group meeting on Monday. Um, it's a revenue bill. It starts in the House. Um, the 5% cap was news to the Senate. Um, so we're working to re- do exactly what you said, reduce the cap. An awful lot of districts seem to feel that if they were capped at five and it's only their residential, so their businesses and apartments are gonna take, and second homes are gonna take a real hit. They're gonna absorb everything over 5%. And I don't think anyone registered that. Um, so we, we're, we're going back and we're gonna phase it in, which was the original kind of concept that we had that, you know, you can't accept that larger loss, 11%, and 
And it's unfortunately, it went through and some of the real winning schools have already upped their spending. So we've lost that balance where we could, you know, phase in what they get and phase out what you lose and have some balance in the fund. And we don't, um, we may have to raise some extra money. Uh, I've been thinking things like in sales tax. Uh, <laughs> Yes. I know, um, but that's the main <clears throat> input into the outcomes, the entire sales tax. System. So I think the bill has till March 15th to pass your budgets. It has $500,000 in it to compensate for costs. We know you're at least going to have to reprint your budget and your balance, and there'll be costs, and we're trying to cover those. Um, the appropriations committee just heard about that this afternoon, but they'll do it. Um, and we're trying, you know, we understand the mess this has caused, um, and we're doing our best to fix it. And what, you know, what you do with your budget is, is your decision. Um, it will impact the tax rate, it will impact my tax rate. Plus, I'm anticipating the city's going to hit me with a pretty good increase. Um, and that's our concern. Nobody could afford a 20% increase in their property tax. And it was probably going to be more than that because school spending went up 20 or $40 million between the amount they had for the December 1st letter and as of last week. So this, a lot of districts seem to think that they were capped at five, or at least their residents were mostly the people that vote for them. And it's debatable if it covered the um, income sensitized people. They may have had to pay the full share. It could be determined either way. And um, my train of thought. But that they could spend up to 9.9. .9, so they spent that. A lot of it was on school maintenance, deferred maintenance. Um, we've got the task force. Um, school construction task force back. Um, there's some recommendations for funding. Um, at this point, it's bonding, but joint fiscal is, you know, that if schools could bond to fix things, they would have done it before and just pooling them together and putting them through the bond bank probably wouldn't reduce it enough to help. But so we're trying to come up with some money to do that because that seemed to be what a lot of people were doing. You know, free money, we can do capital improvements. Um, that's where we are. And the rift thing did not come up. And I'm pretty sure I know what your alternative is, which isn't pleasant. Um, and I will, it, it would, the plan is, I believe it was introduced in Ways and Means today. I have not seen the final bill. They're hoping to get it out and if we can get it off the House floor. Wednesday to Thursday, it will come to my committee. We're having um, everybody in, Julia and uh, Representative Kornheiser tomorrow. So my committee will be up and ready, and we're going to get this out as fast as we can. It's, this we've decided is not a partisan issue. Uh, the tax commissioner, who represents the governor in some ways, has been part and parcel. Jake has been part and parcel. <laughs> we've all, you know, just been trying to work on this together. And hopefully, we'll get it into law in two or three weeks. Hopefully, two. So, yes, sir. Just a process question for you, yes. Jim. We do have our legislators here, but should we stay focused on our district budget for now? We should. We should. Oh, I, I just yeah. give them a chance to talk yeah. about this process because I think it's Great. good to know if there was just anything that additional on the. Yep. The budget process. And that was on my ability to hear yeah. what we're doing, how it impacts you. So Absolutely. when that yeah. bill comes to my committee, I have some ability to know what you know if we need to have something done. Yep. But never hesitate to call me. Yeah. And that timing that you just gave us, that timing context is helpful. Which which means that we would, if we were to open up the budget, we could do it provisionally. We can open up the budget. There's a there's an act that's uh, hasn't sunset yet from COVID that allows school boards to 
move their budget vote back. So we're pretty positive that we can act under that law. Okay. If and the board decides to do it. So, mm -hmm. so if you can't, we can push it back. <laughs> well, we have people who can power, apparently. <laughs> I mean, I guess I guess my question is, is if is if we do if we act in the eight days and oh and for some reason the five percent cap stays. The five percent cap stays. The five percent cap would be applied to whatever new budget we would have approved. Right. Yeah. Which would be a decreased budget. Which would be a decreased yeah. budget with no tax decrease. With no tax decrease. Unless we were to cut yes. three and a half million dollars, as we said, yeah. from the budget. Which I, I doubt. Andy, you want to... yeah. okay. So I, I don't think the 5% tax will stay because as you just raised the whole system, right? Yeah. So yeah. That's the unfortunate, and, uh, and I apologize for it. I think that we have messed up. That when, when we look at the mistake now, we see basically we wanted to have our cake and eat it too. We wanted to have the communities that we're going to get the more students that we're going to get money for waiting to get that right away. But we also wanted to prevent the disadvantaged school communities not to have that. So we kind of wanted to have it both ways. We should have seen it. We couldn't have done both. Uh, but we didn't. We didn't see that. And I apologize because you guys have done a lot of work and having to redo it. And it's been hard on not on you guys. We're in the Waterbury Harwood community, they were not happy with us. Uh, I was in Stowe on Monday, they were not happy with us. Uh, and that's why I understand, well, a little bit, because I haven't actually had to do it like you had, but I, I want to say we understand the difficulty that it's caused and how much work that it's caused and how much just kind of extra stress it's caused on the community. I want to acknowledge that. That said, I think the, the first commenter was like, well, where was your position on this, but every I think it was a unanimous study. Like we did not have anybody. I get a lot of emails on every little thing that we do, do, and there's always somebody that doesn't like it, likes it. I don't remember single persons that don't support Act 27. No superintendents, the no principals, the no school board associations. Everybody was thought it was the right thing to do. We just really missed this thing about the cap. Um, and defend the Senate, we did have this kind of scaling thing as the first priority in retrospect. So you're lucky in that you have Senator coming to as the chair of finance. So anything that passes has to go through a committee. So you do have that advantage to that we can, if there are other tweaks that we can make, uh, we have that as to our advantage. And there's, there's not a lot of time, but there's still some time to make those changes. You know, I'm not on, on the finance committee. I've been following as much as I can because I so I can answer questions, but I'm in, on appropriations. And what we're trying to do is help the municipal tax not go up with all the flooded damage. So try to get as much money as we can to, to Montpelier and, and Barry and other communities as we can to help with the municipal side of things. So that's kind of what I'm focused on. That. So I don't really have anything to add other than thanks for the presentation. I thought that was great. Uh, I do recommend Julie Richter's slides presentation. She's great on this issue as well. But just wanted to, to thank you for your, your time. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, oh gosh, I also want to acknowledge that this has been incredibly stressful for you all. And I was also in those meetings uh, with these other districts that are also having a really difficult time with this. So I have a question. I mean, it's it's also like I, I appreciate that we are working on a, a potential solution, you know, in terms of like removing the cap and this graduated, you know, uh, percentage decrease. But it sounds like the situation is actually worse for Montpelier Roxbury if like under the conditions of this this proposed change. Um, and so that's that's also concerning that that this proposed change may not be the fix that we're hoping for. And so I my question for you all because one one of the other options that I see I, I don't know how realistic this is, but you know in in the spirit of like yes we we all were for the goals of Act One Twenty Seven, but the 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 transition into it has not played out the way we had hoped. Um, 
the thing that I have in my head is like, can we just repeal Act 127, give it some more time, let's rework the formula, um, you know, let's figure out how we implement this because clearly where we're at right now is not sufficient. And so I do, I'm not sure if I saw this in your presentation, I was trying to take as much notes as I could on this. Um, if we if we were to repeal Act One Twenty Seven, um, the budget increase, do you do you have what the budget increase would be in the absence of Act One Twenty Seven? Um, I had thought maybe I saw it, it was like something like uh, more than twenty percent, but I'm not sure if that was accurate. We don't have those numbers because we would have a different pupil count, we'd have a different dollar yield, we'd have we'd have a lot of different factors, so we never did that math. Okay, and would that would that be more stressful? I assume to try to come up with that, or do you think that would be an option worth looking into? I think it would be much more stressful for the state. And and I will okay. say too, and that that question was asked of Representative Kornheiser in the superintendent's meeting, not by me, but another superintendent, and she okay. said. That she said that was not a possibility. Okay. In no uncertain terms, <laughs> it was, that was not a possibility. Okay, all right. Ugh, all right, well, it feels like there are just no good solutions here. I am very, like, very interested in finding what a better solution might be. And it feels, I'll just say from, from my perspective, it feels like we haven't found a good solution, but we are also running out of time. Um, it yeah. also seems like if we if we make any changes uh, to Act One Twenty Seven, then and I I think this is something that we have talked about, um, and I I'm looking to Senator Perchlik and Senator Cummings um, to confirm mm -hmm. this. But if we were to make any changes that we would have to also build into that express permission to go beyond potentially even, you know, um, some of the provisions that may already exist um, in terms of timing and deadlines and, and whatnot. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that that uh, they've considered or if it's something that that you all would need or want beyond what is already in statute. Um, Anyway, so it's, it's something that's on my mind as well. Sort of that point of Senator Watson that I didn't say before is that what we could do is just try to help with the yield. Right. Because we don't set that to later once we have everything. Like we just found out on appropriations last week that we're going to refer $6 million because the universal meals was under underspent. You know, so there, there are other ways to draw money into the education fund that will help with the that's yield, right. which helps with the tax rate. So, right. That is something we can do long term. That because it doesn't, you won't know what it is. You have to do your budget anyway. But we as legislators can say, how can we help all towns by getting just more money into the education fund? That could be a new tax. I know Ways and Means is talking about that. Not always popular, but that's an option. Or just what other five, ten million dollars here or there can we pull into the education fund to help with the year? Right. And Representative Kornheiser announced at the last meeting that this was the first of three education bills she's planning. The second one will be a yield bill. I have no idea what's going in it, but there is a recognition that once we come out of this, if the yield is down, then your tax rates are going up. And I'm not sure what the third one is. It may well be putting more money into the ed fund. Right now, everybody needs to go out and buy stuff because the <laughs> sales tax is what's going in there. Great. Well, thank you. That. Do oh. you want to add anything? Yeah. Uh, I'm happy, happy to pop up here. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, Connor Casey. Uh, Kate McCann's the other representative from Montpelier. She had a medical issue tonight, so uh, apologies for her not joining us. But I, I'd echo what my colleagues uh, say. I wasn't here for the vote of 127, but I'm not going to throw them under the bus because I probably have voted for it, though. So, uh, But interested in finding some solutions. Both as Senator Watson said, I think in the short term, like 
what do we need to do tomorrow? Uh, but also, is it time to push like the reset button a little bit and, and look at what this looks like going forward? Um, I'll say in my short time in the legislature, the education financing system as a whole is uh, completely incomprehensible to most people uh, whose door you knock on in Montpelier. Um, and I think if you ask most of our colleagues up there to explain it, they'd have a tough time too. So when you have a system that's so inaccessible to folks, right? Um, what it does is I, I think it creates a bit of a disparity there and, and that's not right. So I, I'm really interested in looking at ways we can simplify the system so that we can actually have a conversation with, with taxpayers in a meaningful fashion and move the ball forward here. So uh, again, I, I think we're at a bit of a mess here. Um, and it's sort of the last thing our community needs after what we've gone through over the past six months here. It's, uh, I, I was talking to somebody the other day. Uh, I used to think somebody who had like a $250,000 house was rich, right? And now my tiny condo is worth that. And, uh, you know, we're really hitting working people. And it doesn't matter how you reconcile it, you know, with the two thirds at the end, it's still hitting people, right? Uh, so I, I really would like to take an organic look at this uh, going forward here and do what we can in the meantime to try to fix this. But I want to give a good shout out to, you know, Senator Cummings and Representative Kornheiser because, you know, we went up there, we, we listened to the, the school board and we kind of blew the alarm, right? We said we have to fix something. And it's not easy to stop midstream on this. And it's not going to be perfect solutions, but I, I think people are trying their best here. So, so we'll see what we can do. But it's tremendously educational uh, being at the school board here. I thought the city council was a horror show the other day, but uh, it's pretty rough decisions everybody's making right now. And to the extent we can all stay in touch and uh, try, try to get over the finish line on some of this stuff, that'd be great. So thanks so much. Great. Thank you. And I, I uh, heard this day was pretty good, the, the um, education funding formula is Byzantine to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing a lot of thinking about that. I've been here since the beginning. And the reason the formula is so complicated is unlike most, if not all other states, we are trying to respect local control. The yeah. Local people vote their budget. We then have the Brigham decision, which says we have to equalize it. So a penny here is the same. If, and that makes a very complicated system. If we did like most states, and it's been coming up more and more, we, the state, would say to you, this is how much money you can spend on education this year. Do your best with it. And any simplification is going to yeah. be you know, confining of local control. And it is terribly frustrating to us to be told that we are planning to raise property taxes 20% when the local voters vote how much to spend. We set the rate necessary to raise it after sales and all other revenues out. But it's local control that makes it complicated. Mm -hmm. Would you like to do public comment now, or would you like to do public discussion now? Can I ask a question oh. of our? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, Sorry, Senator Senator to, that's okay. Because um, one of the things <clears throat> that we that might help us is a little bit more time. As you saw in one of the final slides from Libby's presentation, we essentially have a week if we were to decide tonight to open our budget <clears throat> back up and revisit it. Which, as she also said, we could decide not to do that. Um, and that is because of the understandable constraints in our teacher contract. Is that something that you could put into like a reprieve on those kinds of deadlines? Could you work that into this piece of legislation? You know, I haven't seen exactly what deadlines. I know that you have till April 15th to get your school budget done. And I know you've got warning times that you have to go through. What we could do with that, I can try. If Email me what would work. And I will, when the bill comes to me, and I'll talk to Representative Kornheiser um, and see if we can do, you know, because we, well, we can 
we wrote the public meeting warning notices. I suppose we can not withstand them. Um, I think what he is asking though, I don't know if the legislature can override a teacher's contract. Right. Oh, so no, that's, that's not, no. Could, okay. they, could they override them? But can we do it fast enough? Because we could, but like, can we do it, pass a bill through both chambers and to the governor in time to where it really helps? Because by the time we get the bill passed, you'll already be at your desk. Our February 15th well, deadline will, is, yes, it has yes. already passed. Yeah. But, okay. but the... Yeah. That is what I was asking. The, the <laughs> deadline we have is that it has to be done by March 15th, right? And in order, and under current law, we need four weeks of warning to get on the ballot. What if we needed two weeks of warning? Oh, that's something that they could that do. that so, so, is not current law. That is how much time the town clerks need. I'm not positive what's in statute. Yeah, I'm very hesitant to take on the town. Clerk. Yeah, those, those, <laughs> those might be yeah, two, those I've, I've may be two different have, things. Have had political careers and doing that. <laughs> uh, Jake, um, section three of that of the bill in ways and means has um, <coughs> some details on the budget vote. Um, a district that cancels the vote um, shall amend the warning for its annual district vote to state that the budget vote is canceled and shall move the date of the budget vote to a date on or before April 15th, 2024. Right. That's not the constraint. The constraint is our teacher's contract. March 15th? Yes. And that's specific to us only? That's everybody has saying. that in their con. Everybody has some date in their contract. Um, it may be different. It's well, it is different by districts. But I you know I was in a, I was in a conversation with with like five other superintendents. Two of them had our same dates. A couple had a couple like a week later. But that's the there's a contractual obligation that we have to our teachers that we have to abide by. Well, I mean, we don't if we decide to reduce our budget in different ways. But we will not be able to reduce our budget enough. To make a difference in the tax rate without having the option of a reduction in force. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you. Unless we take a hundred one and a half million dollars from our savings account. That is the Which only I am not advocating for. Right. I'm just saying it is yes, the only way. Yeah. And or transportation, getting rid of all transportation or getting rid of all facilities work or you know, like that kind of thing that doesn't involve staff. Can, can we ask our union to change that doesn't? I can. Why would they? <laughs> I can. They can say no. Yeah. They might have an incentive if they're looking at a lot of lost FTEs that could potentially be avoided if there's more time to figure out strategies that don't harm those. FTEs. I would say that the board cannot delay their decision tonight <clears throat> yeah. on that. I yeah. uh, I would yeah, agree, I agree with that. And but I got the answer I was looking for from our legislators. They're not gonna yeah. tinker gonna with go teacher contract <laughs> That's all I wanted to know. I don't know if they're, if they're empowered to. Right. Yeah. Thank you. That's yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, shall we dive in? I'm not quite sure how to start. Um, do you want to hear public comment first? Or? Do we want to? Yeah, the first thing is like, do we want to hear public comment first, or do we want to dive in and um, and kind of get our thinking and then get reactions to our thinking, or do we want to get reactions to the um, okay. Tina, Tina wants to dive in. I don't, I, do, do, how do other people feel about that? Okay. Jill. Jill, how do you think up? All right. Thank you. Um, I, I would move that we do not reopen the budget tonight. I have a couple reasons for that um, motion, which I realize may not have any support. We still don't know what the yield will be. Um, it could change again um, and reopening our budget and reclosing it tonight is about as rushed as I feel like we could possibly be when we spent months and months, even with all of these crazy variables, we put a lot of thought of, I didn't mean to say, by the way, this is a fantastic presentation. This Thanks. is incredibly complicated and you, you actually maybe us understand Thanks. <laughs> really, truly statewide. This is a very valuable, I, I think I'm going to share this with other people. Um, I, we spent a lot of time on our budget. We also know that there are a lot of pieces, the vast majority of our budget, frankly, that we don't have a lot of control over. Um, and if we are going to make huge cuts that still result in some sort of a tax increase, um, that feels like 
a terrible way to make decisions and harmful to our students and our staff and our buildings. I, I would rather we go with what we have done, knowing that next week, maybe it's a different incentive. Maybe next week the yield is something different because things have changed so much, even within seven days. Mm -hmm. And then we immediately pick up the conversation, the hard conversation about what we need to do for our budget for the coming year. Um, I, for our lawmakers, I do think, um, I, don't, I don't know exactly how the health insurance piece works, but that really did hit every district. I'm sure you've heard, totally out of our control. I don't know if there is something that can be done, but that is, that is legitimate. Um, I also happen to know that the state does do a lot of property tax exemptions. So if there are certain sacred cows, as I've heard, like current use, which I happen to know a lot about in my day job, I think the Ed Fund and educating our students is also a sacred cow. And I think anything that is a property tax exemption that is millions of dollars should be looked at, even if it's a moratorium on some of these things. There's tax increment financing, there's current use, there's property tax exemptions, there's all kinds of other ways that the Ed Fund doesn't get property tax dollars. And Julia uses that great analogy of a balloon. If you squeeze the balloon this way, the other balloon, right? So we're the balloon, like property taxpayers in Vermont are that balloon that like, there's only so many of us to divvy up that responsibility. So on the one hand, while we're talking about um, not only not increasing any of our services or increasing any of the good things our district are doing, but actually continuing to cut away at it and hatch it away at it. There are other ends of that balloon that I think need attention. It can't just be, we have to find more revenue. Like we've got to, we've got to figure out ways that we can treat the education fund as the sacred cow as well. Um, I do think we, there are so many pieces that could still change. I personally don't feel comfortable voting another budget tonight that then in seven days might look different again. And we did spend a lot of time looking at, I mean, if we were really going to be cutting over a million dollars or more, we're talking not getting kids safely to school on school buses. We're talking losing direct instruction for students. We don't have like frilly things that we can take out of our budget. Um, and that makes me really, that makes me really sad. And I'd rather we try to hang on for this year to get through whatever ends up happening over the next month and then very strategically look at our overall long-term plan for our district, because hopefully by then, some of these moving pieces will have firmed up. That's where I'm at. Thanks. Are you making an official motion? If anyone wants to second it, it'll be out there, but I, I move that we don't reopen the budget tonight, just to get that on there. Okay. So I just want to say, well, we should discussion, but I also wouldn't want us to vote on that motion. I'm fine with the no, motion. Yeah. I wouldn't want us to vote on that motion without doing the, the public, the, not only the discussion, obviously, but also the public comment period that we promised the people who are here tonight. That's just That's all. <laughs> yeah, in I'm, my I'm, mind. I'm just going to launch into it. It's, just, it's very difficult for me to say. I, I think we do have a very viable budget cutting option that, that is hard, that does not have, I think, and I think if I asked Libby, she would say does, that does not have educational detriments for kids. It has huge detriments for, I think, a town um, and a town that we care about and a town that's part of our district. Um, the Roxbury Village School is about 1.5 million. It is, uh, it is a great school. When we merged four years ago, or when we merged in 2018, um, both towns knew that that school was a model that is hard to sustain. Mm -hmm. And we put in the merger agreement that we would give it four years and see how it was doing. And if, you know, and the board was then empowered to close that school if it was not sustainable. Um, and I know we haven't had some of the discussions that I think we'd love to have, but um, <laughs> It's a size that's not sustainable and it's not growing. It's very hard to keep a school under 100 students, much less a school of 36 students. It's been hard to staff. The academic performances there have cons been consistently below what they've been at UES. Those students can be absorbed at UES where they likely get services that they don't get at RVS. It's very hard to make an argument that there is going to be an educational detriment to the kids. I know it's a half hour bus ride. <clears throat> Kindergarten students at Rumney and are in Middlesex spend 45, 50 minutes on the bus, depending on where they live in Middlesex. Same with East Montpelier, same with Callis, same with Worcester. Um, 
and it would make a substantial difference in taxes. We are at a point where our community members are being squeezed. We've had two or three years of very high inflation. And when we're not just talking about, you know, our, um, you know, lower income people, we're talking about people who have six, seven years of postgraduate experience who struggled to get into their family home or are struggling to stay in. This is, it's dance money. It's, you know, it's money for music lessons. It's, it's, you know, money to help with, you know, medicine. I have a, a friend who, you know, has a, a son with, with asthma and insurance isn't covering the prescription. And that's, that's, you know, that's money out of pockets. These are, you know, people, people are being squeezed in a lot of directions. And I think we could have a conversation about RBS. I think we all know what the, the answer to that conversation is. I mean, maybe not, but I, I think we've we've been watching that school for for a while, and it's a wonderful school, and it's it's a it's a centerpiece of that community, and it's it's very hard for me to say this, but there are just so many things that are not working and not sustainable, and the path forward is really hard to articulate. And I think one of the reasons, honestly, that we haven't had a, a direct conversation about it is because we've been a little unwilling to confront the fact that that those paths forward aren't there. Um, and to get to that place. But I think I, I hate to propose closing the school on this quick a notice, but I also feel that given what I know, I am, I'm inclined to not vote for anything where I have to go to my residence in Montpelier and justify why they have to pay a significant amount more per year next year to keep the school open. I just don't think it's a responsible financial choice. And I hate to say that, but it's, I think it's, I think it's our reality. Dick. Uh, let me try to thread a few needles here. If possible, I might miss some of the eyes of the needles completely. Um, uh, first thing is, um, I don't uh, think we should reopen the budget. Um, I, I think it would be too disruptive and I personally don't don't want to cause the community any stress, um, especially the teachers. Um, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is um, that it was talked about very quickly a second ago. I'm not sure if people caught it, um, but our our taxes are not based on our budget. Our taxes are based on our education spending, which is a lower number between the budget and education spending is offsetting what's called offsetting revenues. Um, we, this board made the very smart decision to um, take some of the track money that we had set aside, which was 1.4 million. Um, and we used, uh, or we're planning to use about 400,000 to, to just um, update the track to be safe. But the remaining million was kept it for the time, basically when the 5% uh, protection would expire. The 5% protection is expiring right now. I would recommend applying that $1 million um, to lower our education spending. And I think that should bring us actually a little bit below what we were projecting for a tax increase. And if the yield continues to go up, it'll, our taxes will go down further. That's, I think, I think we should go forward. Um, for, for Roxbury, I don't, recommend doing anything this year. Um, I think it's too disruptive and, and don't want to do it. Um, but I want to point out that uh, the, the, the waves of trying to change public education in Vermont are too much. Act 46 said these small rural schools, you know, are inefficient and expensive. We need to merge them into bigger districts. That was in 2015. 2022, seven years later, you have a totally different legislation that says these small rural schools need more resources. So there's weights for there's new weights in the system for rural rural places Except and Except for ours. Except for ours. <laughs> and small schools. But the irony here, and I was about to get to that as my last <laughs> needle. Thank you. Um, is that Roxbury is losing out on those weights by being with Montpelier. Um, 
So if they if they weren't in a group with us, they would have 33% more students. I calculated. I think it's right. I'm sure it is. <laughs> so so the the and and it's this is not our fault or anybody's fault, but like the constant trying to revolutionize education to try and make it more whatever is is too much for school boards and voters. Um and and yeah, the Roxbury conversation should be had later on. Um and I and we should talk about like you know what if they were on their own such as like Lincoln did um, they would I think their taxes actually would be better off and they'd have their own school and school choice for for um, middle school and high school I don't think it's now is the time to really get into that but that's how I feel about the things we're talking about. Jim, I just wanted to thank you, Libby, for putting that up on the board. I just wanted to point out the um, what Jake was just talking about so that anybody who has not been in every single meeting since the beginning of November with us, the non-tax revenues is this line. Right now, we've got five and a half million going there from a lot of different sources. He's saying make that six million. That's what you were just advocating for. Right? Whatever we didn't do for the track, which I think was about a million, wasn't it? It's actually we we unencumbered a million four. Four, yeah. A million yeah. five from the track and left for there was one point nine originally that was encumbered. Oh, okay. We unencumbered a million five and left four hundred thousand there. So maybe a million five or a million. I'm not I'm not sure exactly, but something yeah, like I that. I just wanted so that everybody can follow along at home. That's what he means. That's all I'm I want to put that in an actual Excel spreadsheet. Well, yeah. I, I would advocate for a different path forward, which is I do think it's worth opening the budget back up again and looking at various different options, including, and maybe this means maybe the non tax revenues doesn't actually mean opening the budget back up again. Um, but I do think there were, I agree with you, Jill, that we don't have like a whole lot of fluff, but I do think that there were things that we considered two months ago, maybe, <laughs> of course we lose track of time, um, that we didn't actually end up applying as far as cuts go because we didn't think we had to, as the numbers we thought were becoming more clear, um, that I think we could apply and bring our tax rate down even a little bit. I, I think um, while this was not a situation of our making, I feel um, like it's not totally fair of us to say, well, we did the best that we could, which I do believe we did. And even though we have this new information, we're just gonna let the voters decide. That doesn't feel totally fair to me. Um, and if we can do some things that will bring the tax rate down even a little bit I, this year, I would not advocate for making the decision within eight days um, that would result in closing a school. I just, I don't think that makes a ton of sense. Um, I do think that we definitely need to have that conversation and we should have it soon in time for FY26, for just determining the FY26 budget. But I do think that there are other things we could find that would bring our tax rate down even a little bit. And it, it would make, it, I, I think that is a responsible thing for us as people who have some decision-making power within this messy situation to at least say, well, on January 17th, we thought we had done the best we could, and now we're actually gonna try and do it even better. That's where, how I feel. Emma? Um, I'm having a lot of uh, feelings right now about what's been discussed, but I still um, agree with, with uh, Jill that I would um, lean towards continuing with the budget that we've already been discussing. Um, I wanted to clarify on slide six, um, where it shows like the value of your house and the amount of taxes uh, that you would have to, the tax increase, the tax that you would have to pay. Um, for a $400,000 house, and maybe this is Christine, but um, we're not showing the difference there between the 5% cap and the new 11 cent 
can, um, the most recent one number that I could come up with was $869. That was with the 5% cap. That was on a $400,000 house, an $869 increase. Does that sound right? With the 5%, you want to know what it was? So yeah, like basically I'm trying cap. to find out what is the dollar difference that a taxpayer now is on the hook for with this new version of Act 127. Uh-huh. Right, it was a five percent increase. That showed us, you know, on on December thirteenth, you showed us that that would be an eight hundred and sixty nine dollar increase from the prior year. Now it looks like it's going to be a one thousand thirty four dollar increase. I'm looking at a four hundred thousand dollar house because I sort of agree with what um, Representative Casey said about <laughs> houses. I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a two hundred thousand dollar house in Montpelier. So I think $400,000 house is more realistic to talk about. Um, but still, that's only what? So you're looking- A $165 difference from the 5% cap to the 11 cent. So it was $860 on a $400,000 house with a 5% cap. And it's $1,034. And which equals out, I think we figured out in our, our administrative team meeting today is, is about $85 a month. Is that what we figured out earlier? So it's an $85 increase a month in month failure. Annual increase over the 5%. <clears throat> we don't, so the, a math question here, because um, basically what I'm getting at is this doesn't seem sub substantively different from the 5%. I mean, it, I agree with what Jim's saying is that $130, $165 in a year can really go a long way to support people's family budget. But I'm also leaning more towards what Scott said about this is going to have the heaviest impact on the one third of people that live in Montpelier that most likely can absorb that difference. So I don't think if we're not talking about a huge difference here in an annual tax rate, I don't see why we wouldn't just move forward because we, we already basically voted the budget through. I think one of the things that one of the things I would point out with that logic is that the 19% the increase that was the 5% cap, you all approved it, but the voters didn't. Well, so right. there's, there's a good chance that could have fall, that could Sure, fail so let's well. put it to the voters and see what they think. And if they don't agree with this budget, then they can vote it down. And then we'll be in a position to have to re-examine the budget. And I think that will buy us a lot of time. I think there huge for this for us and actually in the state as a whole is that in many places, school boards have no ability to change their, their voters' taxes at all. Right. They were capped at 5% and then the CLA, and that there's nothing they could do. And that's that's the situation that we were in unless we closed Main Street Middle School or something crazy, right? right? Um, but now we actually are in a situation where we can lower taxes if we wanted to. Um, and the question is, do we want to? That's right. That's right. Yeah, like and we could have cut, we would do exactly, like we would have kind of cut something like 3.4 million from the other one to have an impact. So so we could say credibly that, you know, yes, like there may be worth some more things we could have pulled for the budget, but it's not gonna affect your tax rate. Now we can say that. I just wanna go back to Jake's idea of putting fund so balance in what's on the ballot that is going to the that has already been printed from the approved is 32046114 which is our general budget 32 million 32 million <laughs> million yeah. sorry we're million not, we're not in like 1792 Mr. comma there <laughs> so i have christina with me so <laughs> That's our general budget now number, not our education spending. So I understand what you're saying is that we could put 1 million into our revenue sources from our fund balance, and that would decrease the ultimate taxes. That's not what's written on the ballot. Written on the ballot is the general budget. And so that number wouldn't change if we did that, right? That would stay the same. Voters would vote it in or not. And so we'd be in the position on a revote if it didn't pass you know like that the voter the board would have to decide that am i making sense like that revenue source wouldn't change the number on the ballot so i don't think it would influence a voter's decision because that's not information they would have yeah 
it would be kind of like a, a promise to the voters, right? Yes, in that case, like if they rejected that um, budget number, then we would have to go and change right. it. Right. But yeah, so what right. I'm proposing is to leave the budget the same, but try to lower their taxes. Yeah. I think I just want to point out that that may not influence voter decisions. And also, Unless you start knocking be, on doors. <laughs> yeah. Because they may not know it, right? They may and, not be aware of it. And that would be a one time injection we wouldn't get back. Yeah. Yeah, that's a conversation I would like to have if we're yeah. going to actually yeah. do that. I don't want to just decide. Let's use a million dollars for that. I don't know if that happens from Scott or Rhett. Rhett um, we were under the impression that the 5% cap would go away in 2019 and there would be a cliff. 29. 29. 29. 20, 29 and there would be a cliff. And that's why we were wanted to take that money away from the track and, and try to keep as much money in that general fund as we could. There's no cliff now. Well, so we're hitting it now. It's not right. Yeah. It's yeah, not. Yeah. So it's, it's right. So it's yeah. no longer whatever, you know, the mindset that we had right. trying to sustain that general fund so that we could avoid this cliff is now. So that's a change. I also want to speak to the idea of the Lincoln situation. And this is going to take a minute. Um, as I've been going through this process, it's been a grieving process. I was in denial because of the school board They're wanting to close RVS. It is not a sustainable model. I fully appreciate that. And then I was angry and then I was doing the bargaining thing and I was blaming people in my head. Um, some things I said out loud, um, but um, you know, right now the, Families in Roxbury that are part of the school system are having a really great experience. They're really having a great experience. And, and some of them, um, and I will never vote to close RBS, but some of them are saying it's, a, it's the best opportunity around for our kids. And some of those folks are teachers in Randolph, and they've been teachers in Northfield, and a lot of people that have been in Central Vermont <laughs> Supervisory Union um, I don't know exactly what the best thing for Roxbury is if the Roxbury Village School is closed at some point, whether it's through this budget process or a future budget process. Um, but I know that this, what the work that we're doing is to try to make this district the best that it can possibly be. Um, there are a lot of questions about that long-term, this, the partnership is different than it was when it started because whatever value Roxbury brought, there were two. There were two different sets of values. The first one was that there are weights associated with rural families and families under the, the percentage of poverty and all of these things. Free and reduced lunch. A lot of that has gone away. Um, the other thing that Roxbury brought for Montpelier was Montpelier is extremely progressive. And it doesn't want the influence of less progressive communities as a partnership. And the idea was, if we get, if we take Roxbury, Roxbury is going to do as little, it's going to do very little to change our values, and it's going to act as a shield so that no, so that the agency of education doesn't force Montpelier to merge with other towns that have very different values. When Lincoln left, Libby wrote a letter that talked about how difficult it is to have Roxbury. And that's, we already have our problems. So don't push Lincoln on us because there was some idea that Lincoln could potentially end up being forced to merge with us. It was floated. There was an idea that was floated. Um, I, I, as I was freaking out, <clears throat> I started dialing numbers at the agency of education. I called probably 20 numbers before somebody picked up the phone. Really? I, you got something? I did. Um, and they connected me with the right person. And then I was talking to people, you know, the Secretary of State's office. The withdrawal process is extremely complicated. Extremely complicated. And what it would take, and I'm going to say this, is three people from Roxbury who are committed and capable to form a withdrawal committee. Um, 
that's not going to be me and it's not going to be Kristen because we don't have the time and we're committed to where our kids are now, whether they, wherever they end up, as long as they're in this district. Um, the process of withdrawal also involves asking a lot of questions. What are the values? What are the benefits and the costs financially of withdrawal or stay? What are the benefits or the costs and from an educational perspective, whether the a district remains intact or it separates. I feel like those questions need to be part of this board's mindset, no matter what happens, because there's been so many changes to the weights. I don't know if anyone in Roxbury can step up and create that committee, but I feel like whether Roxbury Village School continues to operate or not, uh, and I hope it does, obviously, um, I feel like there are a lot of concerns about the viability of this partnership in general for many people. Many people in Roxbury are very conservative and didn't necessarily support it. Most things go right down the center in Roxbury. We had a junk ordinance vote and it was like 177 to 172. It's that's what I think about when I think about Roxbury. It's just like warring factions that can't work together. Um, but we're trying. <laughs> we are trying. We are trying. There are good positive so, things happening. <laughs> so I, I, I guess the point is like the people, the kids, the families that are part of Mont Montpelier in the middle school and the high school are having incredible experiences. Um, I don't know that, you know, I don't know what would happen to Roxbury if RVS was no longer RVS. Um, I, and I understand it's not a sustainable model. Um, I think that this is too fast, obviously, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of homes in Roxbury that don't have families in them <laughs> because they're not suitable. Um, and so when a town falls apart, this is what you get. You get a school that doesn't have many kids in it and that's nobody's fault here. You know, it's a long process. There's so many factors. I've, I've gone through blaming every single group I can think of, and I'm starting to pass through the other side. So I don't know what the point of that is, but I think that we need to really figure out what are the values in our communities need to know what the values, what the benefits are of this partnership, um, because I think there are many. I also think it's hard. Um, transportation is hard. Um, and I hope we don't open the budget. Okay. Do you mind if I know Scott, you were gonna go. Sometimes Rhett and I are, are each of our half votes. We have to stick together here on the board. Um, I think I wanna to speak to the legislators right now. And I think you can probably tell that we, um, this has just been whiplash. You know, I think what you're, you're like having front row seats to the whiplash that we are experiencing um, out of 127, and I think it does create a loss in faith and unsteadiness in terms of the future picture of what uh, the education funding system looks like in Vermont. Um, you know, this kind of fumble with 127, what we're hearing is that, you know, one option, and it's been put on the table tonight, is to close a school in the matter of eight days to reduce a budget by $1.5 million. The most likely place to achieve that is by the closure of a rural school that was to be supported in 46, that has been undone by 127. And as Red has said, does our community have its challenges? Absolutely. There's a lot of really positive things happening in our community where people are trying to come together and change the future of our town. Okay, this school is part and parcel of that. If it remains a school, it remains a school. That is to be determined and the board has the purview to make that decision. Um, should it become something else? I ideally, you know, our community is ready and poised to have that discussion. So coming back to, we haven't had that discussion. And I will say that the merger is still young. This was 2018 that 46 happened. It was, it was several years of just kind of seismic activity of getting, 140, uh, getting 46 passed, landing, and then we had COVID, okay, which was an, a huge blip in progress. I am, I am so impressed with this district and how it is rebounded. You know, it was hell <laughs> in that time. These board members out here were cleaning schools. 
That was one of their primary board functions, okay? <laughs> Our superintendent, unbelievable helming of the ship <laughs> through that storm. And so here we are, we're, we're just starting to get, you know, some, some homeostasis and then bam, you know, the meteor of 127 comes in. I know I'm like, it's a little bit of a retrospective, but I feel like it's important for you all to hear this because I feel like one of the best things that you could do for us right now is to work on the yield and the revenues. You can see the stress that this is like, this is one story. And I, I gather you're, you're collecting other stories, but please do what you can to, to, get the yield to a place that it can bring down our tax rates so that we have the time to have the respectful, compassionate, um, thorough conversation warranted about the future of the Roxbury Village School. Okay, if you drive into our town, you can, you know, it is the heartbeat of our town. The, the, mem the, the community connections, the relationships, that happen by way of the school are essential even to the student's success as they move into the middle school and high school. If the parents aren't connecting there and they aren't creating those relationships, I don't know how the kid gets home from like the tennis match or the soccer game because the facts are you know, you're 35 to 40 minutes away. So we need to think about what becomes of that building and the idea of fast tracking that in a matter of, of likely eight days. I mean, let's be real, $1.5 million, the quickest way we're gonna achieve that is the elimination of RBS and it's been talked about and I appreciate Jim, it is a really hard conversation to have. And it, somebody did need to be brave. I mean, I said in an email today, we cannot speak in vague terms in this moment. We have no time for that. So, but I am asking us to move forward with the budget and for the legislature to hear, please do something about the yield. Get the yield to a place where we, where all of our districts have a little time. <laughs> this has been pure, absolute, complete, chaos of hours of lack of sleep and tears tough you know i like we are working really really hard out here and yes our marps is in this funky position we're like we're, we're right in the middle um but i would i would ask you to work on that second um i i just they're like just based on what i'm hearing tonight it does feel like there's like the left hand is not talking to the right on these things in the state house and these are huge <laughs> things and I know it's a big system, you know, it's an ecosystem. And so all the pieces and parts do need to be working with one another to get us to this place where we have workable uh, programs that are completely interrelated, housing, healthcare, and none of these things can be separated from one another. Um, so I, I just feel that I, I, am, I am inclined to continue with our budget the way that it is and to really message to the legislators, please do something about the yield. I do not feel that we have adequate time to do, when uh, Mount Mansfield decided to close the school, um, I mean, it was a nine, it was like a year long process to get to that. To do the analysis to close a school, it should be ample, it should be significant, and we should have the time, and we should as a board commit to it, and I'm like first to sign up to be on that committee. And it's my community, and it sucks, and it hurts, and like, we're ready. Let's take the time. Yeah. I think I'm done <laughs> for now. Um, I'll be I'll be succinct. Um, for the same reasons that Kristen and Rhett and Emma and Jake and Jill and John before us um, said, I yeah I I am definitely not in favor of reopening the budget conversation. Um, I think everything that you said, Jim. I appreciate that you that you. Um, had the courage to just start that conversation. Um, but like Rhett and Kristen and many others are thinking, th that decision, that conversation doesn't happen in in a week's time. Um, and uh, Jake rightly pointed out that we have we have we have more money in our reserve account than we would save by closing Roxbury. I'm not. We don't have that available to us at all. We the board has 1.5 million in the fund balance available to them to hit the policy limit, and that leaves the board five hundred thousand dollars in their in their fund balance. Yes. And and I just also want to add. I mean, we did save that for the cliff, which we thought was coming. Now it looks like it's going to be ameliorated. We have PCB testing going on. U32 just has PCB problems, like. 
just because we have a million point five, you know, we abandoned a track project. That that track did not matter. <laughs> better overnight. You've got a facilities report coming in in June about this building, which we which came within eight inches of basically being inoperable and unable to open, of uh, eight inches of water. Just because we have one point five million dollars, doesn't mean we should just spend it. I'm, I'm just going to put it out there. Yeah, I was just going to say. If we reopen the budget, we don't have to find a million and a half worth of cuts. We yeah. could find a million or 500,000. I just wanted to reiterate, even if we can do a little for our taxpayers, I think we should. Um, well, Anyone I, else want to speak? I know. Yeah. Uh, oh, are you, and, is there anything neither there? Alar, you're, you don't have to, but you're certainly welcome to. <laughs> get, get it. Um, well, I, I think we should consider using some of the reserve fund. I think we need to take a really good look at Roxbury, but the time we have is not adequate to do that. But I think we seriously have to examine that for next year's budget um, year. And um, so if that means reopening it, I guess we have to. I feel like we worked really hard on this budget. We um, cut everything we thought we could cut. And I don't know that there's much more to take out of it. Um, so I don't expect the line items in it to change a whole lot, but maybe a revenue input can change a little bit by using some of the fund balance. And I just like for public transparency too, you know, I, the Roxbury question has, has been put out there and Mia and I have been reaching out to the Rivendell school district, right? Yes. Um, who's recently, recently closed a school. Process. We are looking to learn from them to see what community engagement that they, um, that they did. You know, we are looking at a report from Mount Mansfield that closed a school uh, years ago. It's not, we are not sitting on our hands on this. We are giving attention to this. Um, so just for public transparency, I want folks to know that. I have one other point to make too. And that is, um, you know, other schools are in the same boat that we are, including U32. And we've talked and they're danced actually, around. They're actually in a different boat than we are. A they worse got, one. They, they, no they have discount. bigger holes, right? <laughs> they're not getting a yeah. discount. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, we've danced around this issue, I think, from way before when I was on the board about looking at combining. And this may be a good incentive. And we're both having building studies done by the same firm and I think you know this year would give us an opportunity to really have a lot more information and maybe a lot more motivation to explore that so I think it, that kind of a year's uh, reprieve here to do more investigation would be helpful and, so. and there's no guarantee that 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 a merger would result in any sort of tax no. de decrease for either community so it, it, no, not to say that we shouldn't have the conversation, but what we might find at the end of the discovery process and conversation is, oh, we actually wouldn't save yeah. any money by doing this. Mm -hmm. But but I think it would be, I, I think we're at a point in time where I'm very interested in learning the answer to these questions. And sure. I, I hope Washington Central is as well. And we will, you know, as, as you know, Libby and I started a conversation with, with Flora and Megan, I know Megan is, Going to St. Mike's next year, and they'll be a, a new superintendent. But we certainly intend to, to reach out in spring and and see where they're at, and hopefully they're very interested in, in that conversation. So um, I'm, just, I'm really interested in, in hearing from the rest of our community. There's two things that I, I wanted to um, ask of our legislators: um, potential fixes. Um, I asked the question about that the table, right? There was a convenient 11 percent effect on the uh, change in pupils and 11 cents. Um, why couldn't it be 22 cents or 17 cents, right? So, so maybe that the, the, um, the adjustment to some of the districts is tweaked slightly um, from what it is presented um, in, in the current state. Um, and then the other is, I, I still don't understand the change in 127 that doesn't allow for us to get the benefit from a rural school. Could that not be a legislative fix? It, it costs more money to educate students in rural districts. We have a 
rural component to our district, it seems like that could also be a potential we legislative. We have the rural component. We have like one of the, we have like the fifth smallest school in the state yeah. and we don't get the small school incentive because wasn't we get the merger grant. Wasn't that because we wanted to encourage people to merge and not the small schools? I think we're going to do everything we can, but the Ed Fund is a finite amount of money, and unless we find something else to tax, um, and I'm going to look at Jake because uh, we just we, we're always looking at that balance. The state's budget is tight this year, and we'll do what we can. I mean, we're also being hit by the other side of town that needs a lot of flood relief and we had a hundred million dollars worth of damage too that we have to cover. Um, so we'll do our best, but I think I would point out to, and I'll say it so Jake doesn't have to, is that if you if you add more to the discount, that's more pressure on the education fund. And so there needs to be a revenue source to make up that pressure. So if if there's more pressure on the education fund, the dollar yield is less likely to increase significantly or at pace. <laughs> I'm really hard, trying hard not to put Jake on the spot because I want him to be a school board member tonight. Um, <laughs> but the, that has impact, right? So it, it's not, a, while I understand what you're saying and I understand the intent of what you're saying, it does impact other things that also influence our tax rate. So it's, it's not quite as simple. The numbers that were being thrown at us by Representative Kornheiser and Representative Conlin, who's the chair of the House Education Committee, was that they're, they're in, they were anticipating a $100 million deficit by how, the board budgets that were approved already. And they were trying to make up about 50 million of that through, the, through changing the cap in the hopes that districts, some districts who added additional monies would get rid of would open their budgets and get rid of that right and so now julia said the other day in the presentation that this cent reduction mechanism costs the education fund 30 million dollars in order to um in order to happen versus so, the 100 something that the cap cost no the cap didn't cost 100 million that was just the deficit that they had oh, to, that sorry. they are working okay. with I, um, I don't know if deficit's the right word but that was the anticipated pressure on the egg fund that was not anticipated at the passage of 127. I see. Okay. It is, it is 830. We have a very patient audience. Uh, let's hear from them. Okay. In the room and online. In the room. Oh, wait, online. we got Miriam. We got Miriam. Oh, Miriam. Yes, sir. Okay. Last comment. Um, I'm not usually a fan of process for the sake of process, but I do feel like given our commitment to transparency and our commitment to our taxpayers, we just need more than eight days to make a thoughtful decision about RVS. I know my own opinions on the matter, but I just can't stomach making a decision that big for students and a community in like barely a week. I can't wrap my head around that. Um, also, I would support using the fund balance to lessen the burden on taxpayers, but I would suggest that we reserve some of that money because we've just had such a chaotic past couple of years. There's been a pandemic, there's been a flood and not to disrespect the, I'm sure completely good intentions of our legislators, but I have no idea what next legislative session will bring. <laughs> just just mention PCs. <laughs> <laughs> just, yes. Um, and I really, as to reopening the budget, I really don't know. And maybe I'll have an opinion by next meeting but I just, I hear both sides of the argument. I have no idea which one is better for the students. Yep, um, so whoever would like to speak, uh, come on up. Uh, I'm not gonna keep strict time, okay, yeah. but- thank you. Um, <laughs> please, please try not to, to to make to blither and, on to say any more than you need to say. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Could we also ask the folks online to do their raise hand now if they intend yeah. to speak? Of course, they can always change their minds, as you say. But then at least Anna can let Libby know how many folks are in the queue. Yeah. Oh, and you can see too. Okay, that would help. Thank you. Go for it, Tina. 
Yeah. Uh, Tina Muncie, I live in Montpelier. And uh, thank you for your thoughtful discussions for all of this. Um, I have to say a 19% increase in my taxes on a fixed income is ridiculous. And you did not see me or very much of me during the budget process. And actually it's because I think you did a great job. Given the budgets we've had before and given the new law, you did the best that you could with what you had in this budget. So I don't know what you're gonna to decide to do with it, but I'm going to ask you, and I'm sorry to do this at this point because you have so many other things to think about, but I think it's really important that you think about the future because it doesn't sort of matter what these people do. It's, it's not looking good for us, no matter how it is. And even though there's no longer a cliff, uh, I can't afford double digit increases for the next five years. And I'm sorry to say that the only way I see to make a dent in this is to bring the students from Roxbury into Montpelier. And I believe that should take time, discussion, and good planning. But here's what I'd ask you. In the last couple of weeks, some, several people have come to me and said, you know, I'm about no on the school budget. Now, why they tell me, I'm not too sure, but they, <laughs> they do. And um, I don't know what to say to them. And I'd like you, whatever you decide tonight, to, to start now with that discussion. To now, when I say now, I mean like next board meeting, set up, you were saying you've been doing things and that's great, but let's set up the process. What are we gonna do? So I can say to somebody who comes to me, I get it. I don't like the 19% or whatever it's gonna be either, but here's their process. They're looking at it. They're trying to figure out something to do next, right? Because I have to tell you, I don't know what to say to them. And if you don't start a process, I'm not sure I can vote for your budget next year. So, ju so just think about that. And before I go back to my seat, I wanna give you two facts. Fact number one is I was on the merger committee and the merger committee, committee never promised Roxbury that we wouldn't eventually bring the students back in. As a matter of fact, we said, if it's financially a problem, we'll need to bring them back in. The second fact is that despite that questionnaire, the education department sends you at the beginning of the year, which I thought had every question in existence, nobody keeps track of busing. I, I called the Department of Ed and actually got somebody to answer. And, well, respond, they didn't answer, but they did respond. <laughs> and I went to the Vermont Principals Association, nobody keeps track of it. So I called the five closest districts in our area. And the average bus time for a kindergartner from home to school was between 40 and 45 minutes. And some of them are on the bus for close to an hour. So Roxbury falls even below the average for getting students from there to here. Thank you very much for all you do for our kids. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm with Dal, and I think you guys need microphones. I, either I'm getting old, because it's very hard to hear you back there. I wanted to thank you all for your work I think it's um, quite amazing that you're all serving and trying to do your best with everything. Um, I am with Mia. I'd love to see you open the budget again, just as to tell tax paper, taxpayers, I'm from Montpelier, and it's a lot of money um, that you're suddenly asking me to produce. Um, that would be a really good idea just to look at it. Also, I don't think you have enough information right now because of what's happening in the um, legislature. So you do need more time. So I would really vote for opening the budget again and looking at things. I also feel it is definitely time to have the Roxbury um, conversation. It's time to bring the <laughs> students to Montpelier. I think that um, I, I just I feel like that would save us a good chunk of money, which would be um, which would be also important. I also think the kids would get a better education being in the district with the services that we um, have. 
Also, you know, I agree with Phil Dunn, we really need to look at U32. There's a question of money, but also the bigger question is, what's the best education that we can offer our kids? And that's something that really needs to be uh, thought. But I wholeheartedly want you to have the Roxbury discussion, like Tina said, soon, very soon, because it's, it's been lingering all over the place. And I'm the CAN coordinator for the Colonial Drive neighborhood, and you wouldn't believe how many people have talked to me about this budget and how horrified they are about what's coming down the line. So I want you to know that. But anyway, thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you, Wood. Oh, go ahead. I'll be quick, I think. Um, I'm Morgan Lloyd. I live in Montpelier. I have two kids at the high school. I'm a property taxpayer and a teacher at the elementary school. I'm a little worried that I'm not going to speak well, but I'm going to try. Um, to our board, I just want to thank you for the really lengthy and thoughtful process that you engaged in to pass a budget or approve a budget to pass along to the voters. I think it was a difficult process, um, but I really believe that you did a good job. Uh, it was hard, but I want you to stick with it and stand by that budget. Um, I think to our legislative representatives, I really feel like there has to be a legislative fix to this problem that we're in. It's not about how much money the schools are spending. It, this problem really stems from other issues like the cost of health care, um, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll just come back to the the timeline that Libby shared. Um, eight days is really not enough time to do any kind of thoughtful process that impacts real people. And by those real people, I'm also talking about the hundreds of students in our district, as well as the adults who serve them. Um, we, we all sat through, I sat through all of those budget meetings, not the behind closed doors ones, but eight days is not enough. Uh, it scares me to think what we might do rapidly to cut some money from the budget. Our district will never recover uh, from cuts that we make in the next eight days, like closing a school. That's not, a, that's not something that a community recovers from or a district. And so I encourage us to take a longer view with this problem, see what the legislature is able to do to help uh, address the yield or the funding, the ed fund. Um, and I guess to the legislature, I just, I don't know a lot about this, so I may be um, oversimplifying, but I see this impact on our community. The balloon analogy is sticking with me, but as taxes go up, uh, as a teacher, I'm very gladly going to fork over the small raise that I get this year to fund property taxes and uh, support my school budget. That's where that money is going, just to be transparent. But I, I think there are others in our community, like Tina, who spoke. Um, the impact on other families is that their rent goes up. They, families can't afford to come to school in this district anymore. Families who really would like to stay here. And so... I think that taxes, tax revenue comes from a healthy economy and a healthy community. And I, I see this sort of, I don't understand how to say it, but like as we destroy our schools by gutting them or raise taxes so high, um, I think we destroy the ability for our community to be a strong economy. And I don't know how to fix it, um, but I hope someone in the legislature does. So. I don't think we can cut our way out of this problem. Thank you. Thanks, Morgan. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, I was here. I'm Tom Frazier. I'm from Roxbury. I was here when we first started this process and objected to the idea of closing Roxbury. And I wasn't going to say anything tonight until that's the first thing that came out of your mouth about, about solving the budget problem. It doesn't solve the budget problem. You still have added costs of Roxbury. You have the busing. You know, I don't know how much it costs for busing, but I saw a figure of 600000 I don't know if that's for the whole system or just for Roxbury. But it's the whole system. Well, how much is it for Roxbury? So you have, to, you have that. You have the building to maintain. 
you have a, a public water and a public sewer system that you have to maintain. You know, it's, you're not going to just walk away from this free. You, you're going to have, you know, you're going to have to buy out our, our contract, I guess is what I'm thinking of. But anyway, the other thing is that after all this machinations about tax rates, it's time for the legislator, legislature to finally take education funding off of the most regressive tax that's known to man and put it on the income tax and do away with all of this system and all this complicated stuff that you've got, you guys, have, you don't even know yourself how it works. I mean, it's just, it, it just boggles the mind to you put a system in place with a 5% cap and then 10 districts or however many districts, not 10, but, you know, a large number of districts take advantage of that and put the screws to the small, to the 10 communities that are really hurt. And what do you do? You can the whole system. You don't penalize the people that played the system. You penalize everybody. You know, I just, I don't understand why the legislature can't get their act together. They've got the huge education department. They've got all these superintendents all over the state and you just can't get it together. Here we are, you think you're gonna close a school in eight days. I mean, it's just unbelievable to me that you would even even say that, let alone, you know, I'm, I'm, I know you think it, but um, but my, my main point is that it's time to get away from the property tax. Everybody suffers under property tax. You know, two thirds of the people are paying based on their income anyway. So it's not that big a change. And it's just time that we get away from such a regressive tax as property tax. I mean, my, my taxes on my house, small house in the center of the village, $5,000. No, $5,200 last year. I mean, come on. So, thanks for what you do, but not really. <laughs> thanks, so. Uh, I'm Nathan Suter. I'm a resident of Montpelier and parent of two. And I'm internally grateful to the school board. And I'm turning this desk because I'm talking to you all. Um, I'm pretty angry. Um, the fiction, the trick that's being pulled, played on us is that the education fund is a finite number. I don't think it's true. It's only finite if you don't create new revenue for it. Right? Couldn't have said it better myself, Tom. <clears throat> I found something on the uh, Department of Taxes website. I might not have the figures correctly because I'm new to reading these things, but uh, in 2022, we had 382,000 people in Vermont pay taxes. Obviously, that's distributed depending upon how much you earn. The looked like the total tax revenue in 2022 uh, was $1,100,000,000. Million, $100 if it's true that the projected deficit on the education fund was $100 million based on this cluster of 127. Uh, you divide that by 382,000 people, that's $261 a piece of income tax, which of course would be distributed depending upon what you earn. To Tina's point, so I'm working, I earn money, tax me on that. Leave Tina alone, right? study. <coughs> And we tried to do that. And it sounds simple, but we ended up, there was no way we could tax the top bracket and not have an impact on the bottom. We tried to keep equity. But I, we did, we have studied that and we have tried. It does sound simple, but it isn't when you start talking. Everything. I don't wish to imply that it is simple. Neither is the property tax situation. Um, I don't mind paying the property taxes either, but I think that the, uh, I am for a progressive distribution of the costs of raising all of our children. When my children are out of schools, I hope to pay taxes to educate other people's children. That is the Vermont way. It's beautiful. 
I think we could simplify it. I think that uh, approaching this as though the education fund is inflexible is uh, a mistake. And I'm glad to hear that you have tried to take action on it, push harder. Don't be bullied by our governor, who is an austerity governor. Um, the $261 per taxpayer has less than a dollar a day, right? Obviously, it's not a flat tax. Um, I think it can be done. Uh, I think the pressure is on you all. I think that in situations like this, legislators from Montpelier and from Central Vermont can lead the state by being visionary and being more progressive, and I want you to play that role. Um, Thank you to the district and to the school board for all the work that you do. Um, keep working, folks. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? There's a couple of people online. Um, it's getting yeah, I didn't want to. Interrupt him slow. <laughs> um, yeah, and it just uh, unmute. It looks like Stan uh, is on the top of the list. So, uh, you're on, yeah, go ahead. All right, Jim, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yep. thank you. All right. Uh, first of all, I, I have three quick points. Um, thank you all. I haven't followed along very, very detailed until 5% became 19%, became 21%. Um, I have no idea how you adequately budget when numbers change that wildly. Um, I believe this group has done the best they can with what they have, uh, but also pushing a budget forward with the knowledge of the large increase. Um, I, I think the community looks at this group as a leadership group, and I don't know how you balance, you know, not taking action on that huge number when so many things have changed. Um, without some kind of messaging, without letting the community know, I mean, I mean, do we want more time through voting this down? Is that the recommendation of the school board? I, I don't know how you balance that, right? But I think in inaction here, not opening the budget back up or not signaling in some way that there's a concern here, right? That we're not complacent with that number. I think it it doesn't reflect well on the leadership group um, that I, I think has done an, an immense amount of work, right? It's, it's hard to water down all that work to a single number on a, on a budget and say, I'm voting this down and I don't believe they did a good job. Right? That's kind of Tina's point, I think, is that's how simple these, this comes sometimes. Um, I, and so that's the first point. The second point is I, I, I've heard 66% come up a couple of times in terms of um, income sensitivity and home ownership. Um, there's there's two concerns that I have with that. One, I, I think it represents homeowners, which represent 55% of Montpelier's residents, 45% uh, are renters, right? So you start doing numbers and it's not 66% of people in Montpelier aren't going to pay more. It's a much larger number. Um, Montpelier, by statistics, is becoming a naturally occurring retirement community. People are moving here and potentially having lower incomes or, or no income. Um, I'm not sure how social security factors into that, but we're, we're driving out folks who have children. I have, I have three kids in the school system. Um, these taxes impact me. I, I, the income cap is not a lot for a household. I know $120,000 sounds like a lot um, with, with two parents working. You know, the average cost for a mortgage of a home amount player is now $45,000 a year taxes are, are six or seven thousand dollars daycare is uh exorbitant right these these numbers add up and for folks who might want to come to montpelier with children and grow our schools they're burdening that cost um more more than anyone else and, and i think we're we're risking continued low enrollments by by driving the taxes up and i don't think that's a school board issue uh, I think others have done a, a better job addressing the legislature and, and the funding. Um, but I do think it's a reality that we're going to continue to see homes in Montpelier sold to older families who move here from Massachusetts, from you know places that are, are impacting through climate change and enrollment drop and tax revenue drop on those who are potentially more able to afford it. Um, so I, 
I, I don't like that 66% number. I don't think it represents our community. Um, I would just ask that you consider what that actually means when we put it on, you know, the screenshots or the PowerPoint slides or say it out loud. Um, and, and lastly, to the folks, you know, the legislatures or, or folks who are suggesting more taxes, um, Vermont is already the 47th highest taxed state in the nation. Um, I think New York and Connecticut potentially are, are higher than we are. Um, these aren't all tax or revenue side problems. And, and that's not to say that the school board isn't doing a good job or there's money to be saved someplace. Um, it's just an observation that raising taxes to solve our problems all the time, um, again, it, it's hard for us who are, are working with families. So thank you again, school board, for all you're doing. Thank you, legislators who have attended this. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. There we have uh, yeah. Phil Dodd again. Phil? Hi, I'll, I'll try and be brief this time. First, a comment for the legislators. Um, the figures where income sensitized uh, payment of taxes kick in were set quite a few years ago. I think it's 90,000 on the school side where you get full income sensitivity. Uh, we've had a lot of inflation since then. It might be time for the legislature to consider raising that level. I think the, the number on the super circuit breaker, the $47,000 in income, which can help with municipal taxes, is very old. These numbers ought to be brought up to today's, uh, to, to reflect their inflation and, and make them accurate again. I just have two other questions beyond that. Was the number you said, Libby, the uh, tax rate would go up 23.07? Was that the number? I just want to get it right. We're double checking for you. So. And and I'm also correct that the income sensitized rate would go up the same amount, 23.07. In Montpelier, the the budget as is with the 11 cent decrease and the assumed dollar yielded 9775 is a 23.07 increase in Montpelier. Yes. And that's the same for the income sensitized rate or go up the same. Uh, yeah. Uh, those those are big increases. Okay, to be determined around the home income sensitivity. Yeah, my my reading of the ways and means things was that it was covering both, but at any rate, it's going to be a big increase for everybody. We'll see what happens if this goes up on March fifth. Uh, but could you just uh, my final question: Could you explain again the timing if the budget is defeated? Sure. If if we vote on town meeting day. Yes. And so if we vote on town meeting day and the budget is defeated, then the board has seven days after the failed vote. And the we would need to have a second vote. We would hope to have a budget passed by March 30th at the latest. <clears throat> that may look different in stat. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. That may look different in statute. However, March 30th is our RIF deadline in our contract. So we would want to have an approved budget. <clears throat> I'm sorry, March 31st is. So we'd want to have an approved budget by March 30th. So you only have a few days, whether you reopen now or have to reopen after defeat. Correct. Thank you. Anyone else online? Anyone else in the room? Just want to give another <clears throat> opportunity. Yeah. Um, when does our education spending number need to be finalized by? I don't. Christina had to leave for childcare reasons, and I'm not positive the okay. answer to that. So I, I can't answer that. I'm sorry. So back to the board, Brett. Well, if the no, cliff no, was going to be in 2029 more. and it's now, then what we were we're keeping in our reserve um, we for our cliff could no, be used now. Right now. Um, if it's 1.5 million, is is does 
is there a way to estimate how much using half of what is available to us outside of the policy requirement, $750,000, is that going to make a difference in anybody's tax rates? I mean, small chunks I, I, now, whereas before, little chunks weren't going to get us very far because of the parameters that we were under, whereas now a lot of stuff we sort of said, well, that's not really going to get us anywhere. And, you know, the community deserve, does deserve us to attempt to bring down the rate as honestly and fairly as we can. And well, I'm, I'm really, I didn't want to open the budget because I didn't know whether there was an appetite on the board to close RBS in eight days. But if there's not an appetite to do that, then I want to help with people's tax rates and have a really robust and, you know, involved conversation about that second question over the next year. Um, because everybody deserves that conversation. Um, so I, I'm wondering what $750,000 from the general fund would do to the tax rate. It would be about 19%. It would get you back to where you were with a 5% cap. I'm getting, um, so, you know, under our previous budget um, and all the 5% cap, we were expecting a $1.34 tax rate. Um, if we applied a million dollars of the uh, fund balance, our tax rate would be like a dollar thirty-two in Montpelier. So it'd be down two cents from what we were telling the community a couple weeks ago. Two cents is sixty bucks a year on a three hundred thousand dollar house. <laughs> yeah. Actual, like, one of us published the scientific calculator. He just had that in yeah. his pocket. Yeah. A lot of probably Miriam. That is. Like the nerd out there. Do you have like a nerd out? She's using her phone. Yeah, I think everybody has a uh, different side. That Jake. So I have a couple of really quick um, process questions. One is. Do we don't need to reopen the budget to change our mind on how much we take from the fund balance? Is that correct? That's okay. a communication challenge. Yeah. Not a reopening the budget challenge. And I believe our parliamentarian made a motion at the beginning of this conversation. That was seconded. I, I, Still. Do we need to have a motion to not do something? That's what Barry said. I probably should have said. So we can let it. We can um, let it lie. We can take a quick vote and let it not pass. Basically, the board would have to make a motion to commit that amount of money from the fund balance. The board does not need to do that tonight because it does not change the number that's on the ballot. Thank you. It's a but, like I said, it's a communication yes. dilemma. But what well, were you just a commitment, really? Right. It's a, a commitment, commitment to the community. community. Well, what were you just saying? Your motion is to not I made a motion open to not open the budget. And it was seconded. Right. Yes. And right. we're not allowed to make motions to not do something? Well, we, we just can. Don't to oh, yeah. You just don't need to. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's a good point. How about? So uh, there was something said during public comment. Um, about facing a 20% increase every year for the next five years. And I haven't had enough time to sit with this new version of Act 127 and what it, how it will likely impact our taxes. But it sounds like basically we're hitting the cliff now and likely the tax increase will be much less in the following four years. It depends on what we decide to do with our budget. Yeah. Our budget, if you... you folks can remember we are increasing our overall spending by three and a half million dollars from fy24 to fy25 so i think it's more about that number that will impact the tax rate for the next few it's years it's kind of like going back to regular times -ish, <laughs> yeah where if, yeah. if our budget increases if health insurance costs increase if we give a raise to the teachers like those factors will either raise or lower the budget, but we're not facing this sort of inevitable 5% increase towards a cliff that's likely to be some insane number that was 
So that's, that's, the last that's my thing. understanding. The only thing I add to what you just said is that for the next five years, if this law passes that amends the transition period, we, we would get that discount. decreasing discount. Yeah. It is really hard to anticipate what the dollar yield will do. Right. Which is a factor we can't control. Yeah. It's also really hard to anticipate, quite honestly, what the what will happen at with our colleagues at the legislature over the next five years. Uh, you know, Stowe's facing a 38% increase. I heard from Ryan today around that. Colchester's at 24% increase. Like, there, there's significant increases across the board You're right now. If they don't open their budgets back up. Right. Yeah. So, um, so there's, I don't know how that's going to play out over the next few years because it's not like your budget goes back down, right? It's, it's going to yeah. stay at a higher rate and add from there or decrease from there. So, but it's not going to, last year it was 1.12. It was a dollar 12. Right. It's not going to go back down to a dollar 12 would be my, that, that, that historical number is no longer a, uh, going to be a, a landmark for us. Right, and sort of the reason why we as a board support this legislation in the first place is that we are trying to equalize, you know, education around the state. And so this, this initial bump in taxes is hopefully going to go a long way towards doing that. I mean, I, I think so. that would be the hope. I mean, so to me, I, I, I still feel like, I, I just don't feel like we have enough time. I mean, it's one thing to say eight days <laughs> to make a decision on closing Roxbury. I think that's absurd, but it's, an, it's also fairly absurd to say that in the next eight days, we as a board will have enough time to really make thoughtful decisions around other big cuts. Um, so I, I don't see, and, and then when you're talking a, a um, two cent decrease with a $1 million cut or influx of money. Wait, wait, can I just be clear on that? Yep. He said a two cent decrease from what we originally promised them, not a two cent decrease from what we're looking at right now. Yeah, it's, so a, it's actually a bigger decrease from what we're looking right at right now. Yeah. Right, and six cents is how much for a 300,000 dollar yeah. house? 180 a year. 180 a year. Yeah. So yeah, I, I just don't feel like the numbers, I, I'm feeling like the numbers aren't big enough to make dramatic changes in what we've already been discussing. And and based on what we were presented with in terms of what could be cut, it already feels like th these are dramatic cuts, basically. Like the budget that we're presenting is, I mean, I was starting to get very depressed about what education was going to look like in five years based on cutting that much out of the budget every year. So uh, I, I don't see you know, coming back to the voters with a dramatically different budget. And, um, and in our budget discussions, I don't really remember any, you know, low hanging fruit no. that were of consequence dollar wise. So, you know, I don't, I just don't know the value in going back to it unless you guys know of something that in your minds is, is, you know, would be of consequence, but I don't remember anything. I think if the board, if the board goes with the budget as approved and it goes down, then you have, a, we have more time, slightly, <laughs> not a whole lot of time, but more time and the administration is ready with ideas of what we could do for those um, decreases. Um, so there, there are places that we could look, that we would have to look, quite honestly. You have to, you have to change it for a second vote. You have to change your budget by at least a dollar. Right? Um, so I think we would need to change it more. Uh, and the administration has had that conversation and will continue to have that conversation through town meeting day to make sure we're ready for that conversation, what that discussion with the board and the community, because it will have to happen quickly. And so and we're not going to come in blind, you know, like blind on that. So yeah. I, I would just say, I don't recall any low hanging fruit, but I do think back to the meeting that we had, I think it was the first one in December when Libby, maybe it was the last one in November, Libby presented those options to us, those three options that had some 
you know, different scenarios of what could be cut out to get us, I think, to 800,000 at that point was the number we were aiming for. And there were a number of things in those options that wouldn't have a significant impact on our children's education. And we didn't do because in the end, we didn't think we had to. So I wouldn't necessarily call them low hanging fruit, but I, that's the reason that I am in favor of reopening our budget is I think we could go back to those things. And maybe that's what Libby's talking about when she says the administration team has stuff in mind um, that I think, I, I think it's worth looking at. Yeah, and I, I hate to harp on RBS, and I totally understand that eight days is a ridiculous amount of time to close a school. I'm also very cognizant that in 2019, before COVID, we started working with a consultant about talking about the future of that school. We kicked that conversation down the road. It's now 2024. We have not had that conversation. Even if we absorb this cliff and ask the taxpayers, taxpayers to absorb this cliff, we have to ask whether that continued expense, given the expense that this district is taking on and passing along to our taxpayers for equity, which I think is worth it, but it is a real expense for our taxpayers. We have to have that conversation. We cannot delay that conversation anymore. The conversation has to start now. It has to start seriously. We can't just say, oh, all is fine. We passed a budget. We're not having this conversation. I do not want to harm that town, but it is a 36 person school that needs a real deep dive into whether it is the best expenditure for our taxpayers' money that we keep asking. It's like, well, it's another $180. What's a big deal? $180. It adds up for people and it's adding up for people. And we really, we if, if we don't do anything, if we don't open the budget, we have to start that discussion. And if the answer is that there's a viable, sustainable path for that school, great. I am all for it, but we have to ask and we have to answer that question. And if we are sitting here next year saying, oh my God, we can't close Roxbury, we haven't had the conversation, it's our own fault. We, we need to start that discussion now. And if we're gonna kick the can down the road, like we can blame the legislature for a bad law, we can blame a Byzantine system, but we owe a responsibility as leaders, as elected leaders, to not just do the best we could for our kids for education, but also to be responsible for our taxpayers and make sure that we we should be concerned about a 23% tax increase. It's big. It hits people in the pockets. And I absolutely support education, but we have a role in being responsible. And eight days is a ridiculous amount of time. I think we should do all we can in the next eight days. If the idea is not to reopen the budget, I am I'm okay with that. But for next year, we should be cognizant not just of the baseline where we are here, but really looking at everything we spend and see if we can give the kids the education that they can have, and perhaps maybe even a better education by looking at some of our, our systems and making some big, hard decisions if we have to. Um, I haven't heard a single board member either in public meeting or outside just one-on-one -on -one conversations ever say that they don't want to have the Roxbury conversation. So. I, from what I have ascertained from my fellow board members, everyone is ready and willing, including public public meeting tonight, our two Roxbury members raising their hands and saying, I'll be on that committee. So I, I don't um, think that the inference that people are resistant to having that conversation is accurate. Um, I... I don't think people are actively resistant to it. I think when, it, when, when this board has, has when, when we've, gone up to it and some of it's actually happened before you you were on the board there's not there's not there's, just, there's not a there's not a resistance and oh i won't do it it's a well before i have that conversation we need a deep dive into our values before we have this conversation we need x there have been and i don't think it's intentional but there has been a reluctance to just dive in is that is that not true, Libby? I would agree with that. When does the facilities consultant report due? May. May. Um, is that a? I mean, we could start soon. We should. We can certainly start I, sooner. I think we start, but we February twenty first. At least, at least getting the ball rolling. Because that's that's the type of reluctance I've seen. Well, we want to have the conversation, but we've got this facilities report coming out in June. Let's wait till then. 
And then the facilities report comes out. And it's like, well, boy, it would be really be great to get this study done too. That's the reluctance. It's so not an active. I don't to want to start an RBS. I would. I would totally entertain that motion. If someone okay. wants to. Would you like to make? A motion? I would make a motion that we start a committee to, um, to explore the question of bringing RBS students to UES and starting the year twenty five. Have a second. I'll second that. Any discussion? I just think we might as well start the committee, and yeah. then that way, when the new board members arrive um, after town meeting day, we can assign committee members. And and my strongest feeling is that this needs this committee needs to have um, representation of Roxbury. Like Absolutely. the Roxbury community needs to be the ones uh, driving the conversation around what happens to their school. And if that is, you know, like. Rhett sort of inferred there's some people in that community that want to bust their kids to UES, you know, those voices need to be heard. I don't want to make a decision, you know, at this table with only two one half votes <laughs> from Roxbury. I think there needs to be like a long thoughtful process that inclu is inclusive of Roxbury, com the Roxbury community. Um, so I'm in favor of the committee being formed and what can we after the committee's charge to be a little bit broader um, and not just be, you know, bringing Roxbury students to Union Elementary School, but um, I don't know how to word it, but what I'm thinking is like, you know, to help Roxbury, you know, make a decision regarding their school and their participation in this district. Because um, I think, you know, I think there are options, mm -hmm. especially with the new weights for them. And I personally would like to help them and understand what's available. Um, so, yeah, I would like, I would be on the committee if it had a little bit of a broader scope. Yeah, and I was paying attention to the Roxbury conversation way back when we first merged with them. And there was all this, like, excitement about the possibility that that space held at that time. And it was like, we could do an early language learner school. We could do a nature-based program out there that would be for the whole district. So I think I agree with Jake, just sort of like a broad sort of future use of Roxbury. And with the, the question mark of, like, does it make sense to start busing those kids to so, UES. So I will, I'll amend my, my motion to, that we start a committee to explore the future of Roxbury Village School. Yeah. Participation in the district. I mean, I, I think whether Roxbury as a town participates in the district is a question for Roxbury, not the district. I, th I think we can examine the future use of the school including the possibility of moving, because I, I want it to be explicit, including the possibility of moving RBS students to UES and repurposing that building in a way that is most reasonably beneficial for the Yeah, that makes sense. The participation in the district is really their call. Yeah. But yeah. And based on the, the law, um, the way to initiate that is for three Roxbury community members to form a withdrawal committee. Then the dis district, the board forms a, a subcommittee that teams up with that withdrawal committee. Um, and like I said, it seems like people really are getting a great experience. Um, and we're hearing 50 minute bus time. It's a, you know, it, everybody throws their hands up. Um, so I just did, I think that it's a really the law is, is very calm makes it very very difficult for a withdrawal to happen. Once the withdrawal happens, then you have to have the select board become essentially like a de facto school board for the town, and then you have to petition to other town to other districts, and then every town in those districts has to have a vote to accept Roxbury. So based on the law, it's almost impossible to separate. Um, because you have, what do you do while well, you're waiting for other towns to have the vote to see if they would accept you or not? So, and once I got into it, I was like, oh, Jesus, this is really hard. Like, and I think it's designed that way because it's not designed for a tiny little town that makes up 10% of the population of a district. It's designed for towns that are 30% of a district, whereas if you pull out 30%, you destroy what's left. 
Whereas in this case, you pull out 10% and it's not going to have a big, a big impact, but that's the way the law is written. It makes it really difficult. I imagine that's probably pretty complicated, but I know that there's precedent. Um, Lincoln just withdrew very similar situations. Um, so I think it's possible. I'd like to learn more about it. Um, and you know, the, the thing is like about the student experience, if Roxbury did have its own district, then the middle and high school students could go to the schools that they wanted, which would include Montpelier. So, you know, know that that's true. There's, no, that I think is, there's choice. There is a choice. Only if okay, we're going down a rabbit yeah. hole here, but only if Roxbury is its own district, in which case they need to hire a superintendent. They need to hire a special education, a special education director. They need to have a central office running their finances with a business manager. It's a quick delete. And that, yeah. that, that expense yeah. is a lot or they have to join a different district. And if they joined a different district, then their students would be going to that high school. I would be happy to talk with you offline, but I mean, I've paid attention to Lincoln and kind of some of that dynamics and how it's played out. And I could give you some perspective on just, you know, how <laughs> some Rox Roxbury folks who've been very engaged with this over, you know, a good decade and how they've kind of thought about these things. So I'd be okay. happy, you know, cup of coffee yeah. or two. Um, so we have a new motion. Yes. It needs a second. Needs I would like second. to add just to a dis discussion okay. when it's time. Okay. Would you please clarify the amended motion now? That to have a discussion about the future of the Roxbury Village School, including exploring the option of moving RBS elementary students to UES in the year 2026 and repurposing that building in a manner that is most beneficial for the town of Roxbury. I'll second. Discussion. Discussion. Um, I just would like to say that I am very motivated to have this conversation on behalf of my community members and the parents of young people, you know, young, young children who have no idea what their fate is. And they are really wondering, you know, how this is going to play out for them and where their kid is going to go to school and if they're going to be bused and what it's going to look like. And they too, you know, as, as, as does Montpelier, deserve a, dis a discussion and a decision. So I just would like to say it's both of our communities that absolutely, uh, that we need to do this wayfinding on behalf of both, com of both communities. I will say. That's it. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Does it uh, make sense? Oh, no, go ahead. It, it's, 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 Does it make sense to um, write the charge in the committee composition before having the vote, or that could happen after? They can have it after. Okay. I think if it's 9.30, it might, it might sound better after. Okay. Um, Mia, I don't know if we can... Mia wants to talk, right? She does. I just texted Anna. Uh, Mia, we're about to get you... There she is. There she is. Go ahead, Mia. There. You can hear me? Yep. Yep. Great. Uh, I just wanted to say I am also in favor of creating the committee. That's all. Any any further discussion? And Jill, just for the record, did you officially withdraw your Previous motion. I can't. I think I can, even though it was seconded. Right? Yeah, you yes. can. Okay. Yeah, you I'll, I'll remove the second. <laughs> I'll withdraw my motion to not do something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Whatever that was. I, I just wanted to be clear for the record that was withdrawn. Uh, so, uh, all those in favor of the motion I just proposed. Aye. 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 Any any nays? Any abstentions? Thank you. No, and and I just I I'm, I'm glad I'm glad we got here. I, I really believe that the community deserves well more than eight days, but I think our, our taxpayers really deserve uh, with the numbers deserve us to make sure that we're <coughs> doing all we can not just to provide the best for kids, but to do so in a, in a way that's that's financially responsible. Um, I think we're at motion. No, do we have 
for a motion to adjourn, are we? Yep. My understanding is we're keeping the budget the keeping way it the is. Keeping the budget the way it is. John Autumn will be very happy. Yes. Uh, so and can we can nice give it. What? Can, 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 can I ask a question? So, Jake, were you saying that if we did Sorry, add, please. like, took a million of our fund balance towards the right. overall budget, it would reduce the tax rate, but by two cents, which didn't seem significant. By more than that, by like four cents. So, we, with the new transition mechanism, yeah. um, we went up four cents uh, from what we were expecting. And if we did the $1 million, we would go down six cents. So, we'd be two cents under what we had been telling the community a couple of weeks ago. I, I suggest we want on the 21st because I suggest we hold off on that discussion on that discussion until we see what the voters do because as you stated earlier there are some expenses. significant expenses that could be coming our way and I would be very nervous if we used our entire fund balance now without knowing what our voters are going to do without knowing what the dollar yield is going to do with all these unknowns. I would like to have that shored up a little bit prior to spending significant amounts of our fund balance because of really the prospect of PCBs in this building, yes. <laughs> quite honestly. And just, I think I've asked it twice. I'm just, there's no reason we need to do anything. The ballot language would not change. Yes. The tax rate would change, but the tax rate could change because of the dollar change. yield, yeah, too. Exactly. Um, and it sounds like the dollar yield is going to have a bigger impact on. Yes. And it sounds like our legislators are open to try <laughs> to help us with that. Really? Yes. <laughs> so I say the board keeps it as is, doesn't make any decision now, and wait. If the budget fails, then we'll have to make some decisions, but we're not in that position right now. Well, if the budget fails, you know, we can't address it with fund balance. It would have to be actual changes to the budget. Yeah. Um, but we could do both. I mean, we, yeah. could, we could make some small changes in the budget. I mean, you know, Elizabeth says, yeah, we have to cut at least a dollar and add fund balance and, and you know, tell the community that, you know, that we have added fund balance to change the tax effect. Yes. Uh, I just wouldn't want the budget to fail and then to be faced with closing RBS in a really dramatic and drastic, speedy process. So, yeah, I agree with that. And, and you know, one of the reasons that I wanted us on record is having an RBS process. So, so that's part of yeah, what so we could, responses we could, to a failed budget is that we're established to yeah. draw a, a RBS future committee. Yeah, that we are. Even before a failed budget. Yeah. yeah, I think before a failed budget, I think we tell them. I like that sunny yeah. disposition, yeah. Emma. Yes. Yeah. Hopefully. How about before budget vote, so that yes. we voters are informed that we are being proactive. Being proactive. Even more. Even more. So. Uh, well, before I adjourn, thank you so much for um, for all your work. I know that you've probably gotten beat up a little the last few weeks, um, and, but um, yeah, we certainly supported the law. The intent behind the law was the right thing to do, and we thank you for it. And we know the mechanism was wrong, but um, we are very thankful for your attempts to fix it. Uh, and I, I think we will be thankful of those next year when hopefully the, you know, the Ed Fund is on a more sustainable path than it was with the cap. So we really appreciate you coming and uh, sticking with us for three hours because I, I know you've had well, probably a long week already. Uh, so, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and thank you, Anne, for sticking through. I saw you. We do some some parenting as, as well. And I'm sure you're tired also. So uh, thank you all. Uh, and Emma, again, uh, thank you so much for all your service on the board. Uh, Take your nameplate. Yeah. <laughs> your bedroom door. <laughs> uh, um, now, your, your service has been tremendous, uh, including tonight. So.
Thank you very much. And you want to make the final motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Great. Thank you, everyone.